Hi, this is Dan Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. Hey y'all, I'm Johnny. And I'm Colleen. And, and we're, we're the Keel Quest. Quest. And, and we, we want, want you to keep, keep the adventures, adventures alive. alive. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, this is Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. This is David from Beachley Ironworks saying keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Dan Mayock. Keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Kevin Collin, the Happy Camper. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Awesome! Shug here. Keep the adventures alive. I am. Ethan here, the Avid Outdoorsy guy, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. We're John and Aaron. Keep the adventures alive. Hey everyone, it's Kylan from Lure of the North, and I encourage you to keep the adventures alive. This is Sky North telling you keep the adventures alive and now on with the show well good evening everybody happy tuesday evening and welcome to another episode of canoe hounds outdoor adventure show a show that brings you a lot closer to the great outdoors my name is dennis also known as canoe hound and uh we got a doozy of a show for you guys and gals tonight uh so sit back relax grab yourselves a nice cold beverage hot beverage whatever your choice is and uh enjoy the next couple of hours with us uh, if this is your first time tuning into the show, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we are live here every Tuesday evening, and hey, man, we're going to bring you all kinds of great topics of outdoor things, and we're going to bring you all kinds of really cool guests. Uh, it's something so, something you're going to enjoy, hopefully. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good thing, so be sure to tune on in. Uh, before we get started with tonight's topic and guests, uh, we're going to let the chat over there populate, so uh, we're just going to bring you a couple of quick announcements here. And then, uh, then we will get on with the show, uh, something that we do here all the time, right? Uh, last week, we were joined by Sean Pedersen from the, uh, he's the founder and the uh, main moderator of the uh, Ontario Backcountry Camping Facebook group. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar about or, uh, of that uh, particular group, do check it out because, you know, there's a lot to learn there, uh, lots of great tips, lots of great people. I believe they have over uh, 15,500 group members. Okay. So there's a lot of education to be had through that. Uh, it was a really fun night there. We got to learn how uh, Sean actually got the, sh the, the whole uh, group started and as things transgressed and, you know, to where it is today. And uh, yeah, it was, it was truly a fun evening. 
Uh, from last week's show, I just want to throw a congratulations out to uh, Mike Keels, uh, a.k.a. Mustang774. I could see you're in the chat tonight. Congratulations on winning last week's uh, swag giveaway. He uh, he answered correctly, and he was randomly drawn uh, via a random number generator that I do every Sunday night. Uh, he's been notified. His prize is actually in the mail, so we are good to go there. Uh, keep your eyes open for that there, Mike. Uh, let's see here. Last week, we also, uh, at the beginning of the show, we had Tori Baird was on and she was telling us about, uh, uh, an auction that they have going on Instagram to raise funds for Fox G1. Now her, her son, uh, Wesley, that's, uh, Jim Baird and Tori Baird's son, uh, Wesley has, uh, has Fox G1 syndrome. And, uh, you know, they're, they're doing some great research on that and they're trying to raise funds to, to be able to help with that research. So if you weren't on the show last week, I posted up in the top of the chat there. You'll see there's a link there to their Instagram auction. Go on. There's a ton of great, great, great things that you could actually bid on. Uh, maybe get a good deal. You know what? Pay over value. What the heck? This is It's a great cause. Uh, you know what? I also mentioned last week that the items that I donated, that if they went for value, what the value was, that uh, I would also include an additional fifty dollars out of my own pocket towards uh, towards uh, as a donation to the Fox G One research, and you know what? The very first bid that come in was five dollars over value. So thank you very much to the person who bid on that. Your heart's in a good place, and let's keep that going. But by all means, please do check it out. You only have a couple days left to uh, to be able to get in on the bidding action. So check it out, man. You might find something on there that uh, you're really uh, you're really gonna dig, right? So that's good stuff. Uh, just want to throw out there to my lovely wife. Uh, today is my 30th wedding anniversary. I am married to a wonderful woman. I call her Mrs. Canoe Hound, but her name is Cheryl. And you know what? She, she's the best thing that's ever happened in my life next to uh, the birth of my daughters and now my grandchild. But you know what? Happy anniversary, honey, if you're watching. I love you very much. And I'm looking forward to the uh, next 30 years. It's going to be a fun ride. So let's let's keep the, uh, the wheels rolling there. Uh, tomorrow night on the camping show. Now, a couple weeks ago, we had CW Gets on the show from a, a, a podcast and a live stream called The Camping Show. It was a really fun night. And uh, I am now going to be a guest on his show. So if you're looking for something to do tomorrow night, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, go to a channel called CW Gets Outdoors. I'm just going to pop that up here on screen really quick so you can actually see what you're going to find when you, right there. So if you go to CW Gets Outdoors, and uh, by all means, please do tune in. Uh, if you want to learn anything about, uh, get to know a little bit about me, myself, Great opportunity. I know he's got a list of questions. That's uh, that's gonna kind of let all the uh, the worms out, you know, let the worms out of the can. So, please do join us. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow night. Uh, a couple more things here. Uh, as usual, I always shout out my uh, my channel members. Uh, thank you to all my channel members. But as a perk, I always shout out my solo tripper paddle members. Okay, so we've got uh, Stein North, uh, Kevin with an A. Got Jeremy Walla, Smoking Our Barbecue, and Pam Bookham. Thank you, you guys. You all rock. Uh, the support is greatly appreciated. And uh, you know what? I look forward to doing you guys good every week. So thanks very much for your support. If you are considering becoming a channel member, if you look down around here on YouTube, you'll see a join button. Feel free to click on that. Get the details. Become a channel member. You know what? Uh, it helps support the channel. All the money comes back out to you guys by giving away swag and stuff like that. Uh, it helps pay for, you know, the streaming software, some new equipment, so we can try and get things uh, looking a little better for you. Maybe I'll invest uh, in another internet service provider so I can actually get some better internet service because I've been having some real internet woes of late. So uh, we are we are working on that. We're looking into that, and we're going to see what we can do to uh, get a better quality broadcast coming across to you. So uh, support is greatly appreciated. I also like to shout out my uh, my channel supporters as far as businesses are concerned. Uh, first is always the uh, Backcountry Coffee Company. They supply me with uh, great coffee uh, every week here for the show. In my new Canoe Hound Adventures mug, check that beauty out, eh, people? Uh, they will be available for sale also on my website very soon. I will make an announcement once they are uh all ready for uh, for sale. Uh, I also like to uh, thank Kid Products, makers of the Kid Twig Stove and Reflector Oven. Uh, we've got uh, 
uh, Ursac USA, Great Signs and Graphics, Short Hills Beard Company, and our friends over at Algonquin Outfitters as well. So thanks very much to them for their ongoing support. Uh, it really helps. Uh, they're the ones, they don't pay me any money to do any of this, okay? I, I don't get any payment from these sponsors. What they do is they give me swag, and that, that's the stuff I give away back to you guys when we have our do, our big swag giveaways. So, you know, I, I count on that there. It's, it's something to give back to you, and uh, it's a great way to support. I'm not looking for funds from them. It's, it's just about all giving back to you guys and gals. So uh, let's see. Two more things. If you have any hot topics or guests you'd like to see on the show, drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com, and I will make sure I do my darndest to make it happen. Okay, um, sometimes it happens quick, sometimes it happens slow, but please do get your ideas in. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. Or you can also check out canoehoundadventures.com and you can leave me a, a message on the form there. So by all means, come on over and check us out and give me some of those suggestions. And then of course, tonight, interactive show as it always is. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, put the word question over there in the chat. Uh, and then your question, uh, if you put question in capital letters, it makes it a little easier for me to identify and we'll try and get all your uh, questions answered. All we need to do is, uh, we need to see them and we have to have time to get them on screen. So that is that. And without further ado, I think it's about time that we get into introducing tonight's guests. Uh, tonight I'm being joined by, it's supposed to be six, but we're going to be joined by five, five, uh, remarkable young men who stepped up last summer to raise funds for food banks, Canada. Uh, by embarking on a 60-day, 2,000-kilometer canoe trip across Ontario. Uh, please welcome to the show, we got Nolan and Will, and we got Kaylin and Georges, and we also have, oh, Jacob. Jacob's been having some uh, some difficulties with his, uh, his live streaming tonight, so we will see if we can get him back in, and then we'll pop him back up. How you doing tonight, boys? Not too bad. Good stuff. You know what? Okay. Just to let everybody in the chat know, tonight you're going to hear the word boys a lot. I, I realized that when I seen you guys on with uh, Kevin Callen's um, uh, Whiskey Fireside chat. Uh, a lot of the interviews I've seen with you guys, and it's always boys. Eh? So that, that's cool. Boy power. Boy power. <laughs> Good. So how you all doing tonight? Good. Yeah. Happy to be here. And yep. Dennis, happy 30th anniversary, you know? That's Thanks, great. man. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it with us. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's COVID time. I, I couldn't even take my wife out for dinner tonight. You know what I mean? It's, uh, right. Yeah. We, we, had, we had sloppy Joe's for dinner at my daughter's house. So, yeah. yeah. It works, though. It works. It's all good. Um, so I, I, I want to start by just by how, how do you guys know each other? Uh, you know, it's a cluster of six guys. Did you all go to school together? How did you all become acquainted? Um, I think, yeah, so pretty much like we all came, became acquainted with each other through uh, camp, uh, specifically uh, Amic of Taylor Staten camps. And we, uh, you know, we all sort of came from pretty different backgrounds. Like some of us have been going there for a very long time. Um, and others like myself and uh, Kaylin, it was our first year, um, uh, our CIT summer. So it was our first year as staff. And and we all sort of, that's where the six of us sort of met and came together. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we all really had like a deep passion for canoe trips. And then, you know, when quarantine hit, I guess, Kaylin and George's can sort of speak more as to like how the trip came about. But yeah, it was camp. That's how we all, all met each other. Cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll get we'll get into that because I do have questions about how the heck you guys uh, happen to come up with a trip like this. And Well, you know what? Let's just do it. How did you guys come up with a trip like this? Okay, like you're you're all buds, you know, through through camp. Were you all counselors there, type of thing? Is that uh... counselors and training? Yeah. So okay. Less pay, more work, kind of thing. Less pay, more work. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah it, was, uh, it was a great summer, summer 2019. I got to meet you know all the rest of the boys. George is the reason I went to camp. You know, and we were there, and then getting excited for the summer of 2020. All the canoe trips that we would all lead together. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic hit um, and we were faced with this kind of reality that the camp's probably not going to run this year. Right. Um, and, you know, instead of, you know, at, at first we just kind of, I kind of accepted that and there was hope and that hope slowly would diminish day after day as case numbers would rise and, you know, it would get closer and closer to that day to camp starting. And um, one day me and George were 
downstairs in his basement, we were quarantining together and uh, we kind of let's do something crazy. Um, let's do a 60 day canoe trip if, if camp gets canceled this year. Nothing, no, you know, just a 60 day canoe trip. Let's start planning it. You know, it probably won't happen, but you know, that's what we'll do. And then as slowly as it progressed, we kind of realized, hey, we could do this trip for more than just ourselves. This trip can be bigger than us and bigger than the six of us. It could be a way to help out all the people that have been impacted economically by the pandemic and uh, raise money for Food Banks Canada, which is what we did. And then, you know, thanks to the support of like all our sponsors and everyone who saw, shared and donated, like it just blew up and it became possible for us to actually get all the stuff we needed to go on the trip. And then, you know, there was months of planning, like all of us just sitting down, like being like, do we have everything we need? <laughs> like, you know, like, did we forget something major? Um, but, you know, as far as it goes, I mean, Will, who, who planned out the route is uh, just like perfectly and um, spent, you know, so much dedicated time on that route. And uh, we all kind of had our own niche little area where we were working day after day after day in those months of April, May, and June. And then come, you know, June 26, we were out on the water in Wabakimi Provincial Park. Wow. So now you, you talk of, of the planning. Now, you, there's six of you. Did you all, like? are you all living in the same area to be able to sit down and plan this out? Like, uh, Jacob, you're, you're out in Halifax, are you not? Yeah, so I actually live in Toronto with, like, everyone else, but I'm just in school right now, so I'm just staying out in Halifax. Okay. But we all, uh, we're all from different parts of Toronto, but we all sort of, like, we know, you know, we followed like the precautions, we followed like social distancing rules, but we all sort of became like a bubble together and started working on it at like each other's houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, we, for the first part, we were all doing like Zoom calls. And yeah. Zoom calls. And so many yeah, Zoom calls. calls. Yeah. And, um, so we, did, and we had like, you know, the Zoom limit, the free Zoom limit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Calls would cut <laughs> off after like, what was it, like 40 minutes? And then we'd have to like, call back and so we were like trying to organize this stuff and our calls kept like ending like, <laughs> yeah. like four consecutive calls just to get everything done Jeez. Yeah. yeah and who wants to pay for it right yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey we're all on a fixed budget here <laughs> so okay so now you got you guys uh being counselors and training type of thing and because of covid there the, the whole the whole camp thing is obviously squashed because because of COVID. Is that the duration, like the 60-day duration of the trip, was that how long you would have been at camp for in the summertime? Well, uh, our camp does a 50-day a canoe trip. That's sort of a tradition there. Um, yeah. Tim and I have done the 50-day canoe trip there. Um, so we just decided we wanted to take that and then just like crank it up to 11, just go one step further, you know. So why not slap another 10 days on the end? Yeah. Okay, so now now you guys are sitting there. And it's like, okay, let's do the sixty day trip. Um, first off, how, how did you determine that you wanted to do like two thousand kilometers from? Where, where did you start? Uh, Armstrong. You know, Armstrong. Are you, okay, Armstrong all the way down to Ottawa. How, how did you? Well, Ottawa is kind of a given. Hey, eh? that's a great way to stop like, <laughs> to end a trip if you're if you're raising funds and for you know for for notoriety and stuff like that. But how did you determine to drop us off at that bridge up up in Armstrong? Like, oh, well, it's a, it's a bit of a process. Um, I feel like, like months before we even came up with the idea of doing a 60 day canoe trip, I was just bored at the end of August, like the year prior. So it's just like making canoe trip routes that I like, you know, with Google My Maps, it's like a free Google application. I was just like making a bunch of routes just for the fun of it. You know, maybe I'll do these someday in the future. Then these guys approached me at the, uh, 60 day canoe trip and I was like, all right, you know, I think I can stitch a few things together and make that happen. Um, but yeah, pretty much like the reason we started in Armstrong is because I always really wanted to see Wabakimi Provincial Park because I heard it's absolutely beautiful and I've never been there myself. So I decided, yeah, you know, that's where we're going to start. And I wanted to make a route that would go to Algonquin Park and end like on the same lake where our camp is. Because uh, the 50 day canoe trips at our camp, they all end at at the camp itself you know they drop you off somewhere far away and you come back so i pretty much wanted to replicate that but coming from a little farther away and then uh when 
uh, we brought in the fundraiser aspect this Kalen suggested why don't we end it at Ottawa and uh, yeah from a fundraising perspective ending at Ottawa is much much better because you know when you tell people oh I'm going to Canoe Lake they're not really gonna that doesn't really click with people whereas when you're in like when you're like in Chaplone you tell people we're going to Ottawa you know it's just it's a completely different reaction um, but uh, yeah so uh, we uh, started up in the uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park, uh, did, did a little bit of a sort of kind of loop around there, saw all that, uh, and did Lake Knipigon, and uh, we went down to uh, Lake Superior, did a bit on there, and then we went back inland going through places that I've uh, mostly been to on previous canoe trips that I wanted to get the chance to revisit, and we uh, went to a few new areas as well. It's pretty amazing how you how you can actually piece things together like that, eh? Like what 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 a great uh, geography and topography that you can actually, you know, make your way all the way down, like much like the voyagers would have done, or you know the the uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's amazing. It just uh, all, all these bodies of water, how they're so interconnected. You know, did you did you have ever had along the trip any portions where you had to be shuttled? Were there any of them uh, types of things? Uh. Yeah, it happened on uh, Lake Superior. Um, we were like, you know, the route was planned uh, with anticipation of the prevailing winds being on our side. But uh, summer 2020, that July was, was just an odd summer. Uh, bad wind, the whole time the wind was going going towards the west. We expected it to be going towards the east. So uh, Superior was quite difficult. We had to uh, get get a bit of a shuttle at one point. But uh, we, we made up the extra distance in land doing stuff on small lakes. Mm -hmm. that's cool so you guys watch, watching your first video there's two episodes that are out so far correct um the first episode was was really cool like i well they're they're both really cool but i really enjoyed the first episode because right off the hop you guys you guys run into a lot of issues it's it seemed like uh every other scene now Nolan, you did most of the editing for the video that's correct yeah okay so through through your editing, it seemed like you know it went from one one thing happening. I, well, you lost the GoPro into the water. Yeah. That, that was a horrible GoPro. Uh, you forgot a GoPro at, a, at uh, one of your your rest spots. Um, somebody took a stick in the eye. Uh, was that you, Jacob? That was Nolan. Oh, really? Or well, okay. And it, it just seemed like one thing after another. It was happening. At, at any point, did you guys think like, what the hell are we doing? Well, so I think <laughs> something that's important for people to remember is like when I'm editing, right? Like we have, we had, when we finished the trip, a terabyte of footage in total, right? Like so much footage, like we're not going to put all that footage out there, right? And like, who wants to watch, frankly, who wants to watch like, you know, like an hour long video of like a portage, right? Like you gotta, you gotta cut it up and like show like the interesting bits, right? And so that's what I was trying to do with the editing. So it's just kind of like the interesting bits, right? Like you don't really see like the hours and hours of monotony in between those uh, sort of significant events, right? And there was a lot like with the time constraint, I really didn't want the uh, episode to run, any of the episodes to run over like 50 minutes. I was trying to cap it there and with that time constraint it was just like yeah like uh, so those things sort of tended to stand out but uh what's it called i think i think those sorts of mistakes as well were mostly just due to us sort of adjusting to being back on trip as well as like two of the things you mentioned were camera related right like yeah. we're not none of us had ever tripped and tried to film a documentary while we're on trip before right so it's like trying to do both of those things like hand in hand was pretty difficult right and when you're trying to do like our average what we're what like 35 kilometers yeah, a day on average yeah. but in that first seg i think it was a higher average per day and it was like we were trying to do some pretty big days and it was like a lot of you know in and out of the boats and when you're doing that and you're trying to like keep your camera management really tight it's really difficult to sort of uh keep you know like all the cameras accessible enough that you can shoot any given moment if something comes up and you want to film it but also secure enough that you're not you know losing cameras so i think that a lot of that was just sort of us getting adjusted to being on trip and tripping in that style of with the cameras and sort of how to manage that 
because there's, there's a lot less of that in the later episodes. It's really only episode one we actually lose any cameras. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, Dennis, to say on that part too about how it seemed like a lot of things were going wrong. Well, that's canoe trip, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Goes wrong. Learn through adversity, right? Yeah, everything goes wrong, you know, a billion times in ways you never think, and then you have to figure out how to fix it. And that's where you really take those moments where you learn from the trip, and you also have the best stories. So sorry, Will, for that stick in your eye, but that's made for a great story for me. Yeah, it was a great story to me. <laughs> one eyed Willie will live forever. Yeah, one eyed Willie. Right I'm also just noticing in the chat here, Conjuring Rock had a question about what software we use to edit the video. So yeah. I personally use a number of different softwares. I use Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere, um, and Sony Vegas uh, Pro to do the video editing. So I do the majority of the editing on uh, Vegas Pro, but uh, I had to do, I had like, there were some weird issues like importing the stuff from the phone to my PC. So I kind of had to run some of it through Premiere. It was like a bit of a weird rig, but like it got the job done. And then I did the map flyover edits in After Effects. Um, and then some stuff like, uh, there's like our sponsor screen at the end and and the thumbnails that was all photoshop so yeah no you, you've been uh, doing a very good job of editing uh you've had me captured watching the uh both videos uh to this thank point you. yeah <laughs> what's with that it's a little round of applause yeah <laughs> <laughs> so okay now you got you guys are all like you're you're not you're not quite 20 yet right so you're 18 years old when you guys are doing this trip Six guys, right? You put six guys alone for uh, you know a week at a time, but between seeing other people, uh, how, how do you keep the morale up? How do you how do you stop from uh, killing each other out there? You know, you get the the arguments going, or you like you know the testosterone kicks in. In, in other words, what I'm saying. So, uh, like, how, how did you guys keep the morale going? Uh, positive beat. The way I saw it was like. We honestly were just focusing on finishing the day and no matter what went wrong, no matter like, you know, Will got a stick in his eye, someone fell, someone's in a bad mood, didn't really matter. We all just had the common goal of like, you know, get to the campsite, deal with the problem then. Obviously, if it's an injury, like Will's eye, deal with it in the moment and then, you know, go again at the campsite. But if it was just morale, honestly, the morales were always kept pretty high. Like even at the darkest moments of the trip, the boys just sort of like, used each other to help boost each other up and we just use that like energy and like the boys around you just pretty much pushed you to get to the campsite and it was all just about you know you got to keep moving can't well, think magic. what just happened yeah. i think with like such an ambitious route like we yeah. did with those long days especially in the first couple segments i remember uh there's a there's a common saying that will used to say that it was like it doesn't matter we'll get there when we get there we can take our time we have all day or something along the lines of that You'd hear that a couple times, and we all kind of knew these days weren't going to be easy. This trip was going to be hard, but you get to the campsite at the end of the day, you eat your food, and you go to bed, and everything's all right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we – dealing with, like – I think uh, Bruce Heyer, who is someone we met in the – you'd see in the first episode, and um, he kind of runs the show out in Wabakimi Provincial Park. I, uh, I called him a month after our trip and he told me he was inspired by us because he saw that there was no individual leader in our group. And he said that he always believed that canoe trips need a leader or two guides, whatever it might be, to lead the group and put it on. But we didn't have that. We had every single person have an equal say. And you can see that in our in our episode too, right? Yeah. When we get in this debate over where we're gonna go um, when we're in the town of Missinabi. And that was because we couldn't, we, we were split three and three, so we needed to figure it out, right? And that's how everyone had that equal say. And, um, you know, we had our moments, nothing Lord of the Flies, right? But we got, uh, we got you know, we, we, yo, you have your arguments, right? Yeah. But, you know, we love each other and, uh, Rock, paper, scissors. That was a lot of <laughs> I was going to say, how many times did rock, paper, scissors come into play on this scissors. trip, right? Maybe we try to have a vote unless it's a 50-50 split. Uh, you know, we usually talk it out. But. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd also just like to add on to Kalen's point there. Of like, I think anyone who's, like, going on a trip, you know, like a, a long trip like that, like, it's someone who really wants to be there, right? Like, you're not going to get someone – 
and, and especially with our group, right? Like everyone in our group, all six of us, like really wanted to be there and was really like enthusiastic about the route and willing to really work hard, you know? So we sort of had this communal, communal consciousness of wanting to work hard and wanting to push ourselves and wanting to get past the next goal, right? So when you have, when everyone's pulling their own weight, you know, you don't really have a lot of that friction. Oh, it's, I guess, Will froze up or am I? Okay, Will froze up. Anybody want to finish that <laughs> sentence for it? Okay, he's back. He's yeah. back. <laughs> but yeah, we, we're just, uh, I was just saying like, yeah, like uh, whenever it pulls their own weight, you don't really need to have a leader because like, I, I think the only purpose that a leader served was maybe like on my camper trips when, you know, like maybe not everyone wanted to necessarily be there. And it was kind of like some people were pulling significantly more weight than others. And then you kind of have that leadership role of the counselor to sort of tie everything together. Or I guess if it's a, not a camp trip, you have the leadership role of the guide to sort of tie everything together. But I think on our trip, that wasn't really an issue because everyone wanted to be there and was pulling their, pulling their weight. That's cool. Yeah, adding to that, Nolan, I'd also say, like, we also all were very experienced, right? Like, we all, like, it's exactly what you said, but we're just all, like, we all knew what to do. We all knew our roles on the trip. We all knew what had to get done. And that way, we didn't really need a leader because we were all leading, like, our own aspect of the trip, if that makes sense. And that's why I yeah, think it works yeah. well, too. Because we were all yeah. leaders in our, like, own little way, like, in our own role or in our own question right now different jobs on trip yeah so yeah conjuring rock right and this, this is a perfect segue for yeah, it right like, right you right had a different job on the trip i remember in the first video you all introduced yourself and you said what your your task was on on the trip right would any of you choose a different job if you did it again um i i i personally wouldn't um i think the reason why a lot of us picked the jobs that we did right like it wasn't really spontaneous like a lot of the jobs that we ended up with were things that we'd been doing in our camper trips and our staff trips already for like however long. And it was just what we knew best to do. And like, we were already like sort of had preconceptions of like what we were really good at going into the trip. So I, I think like, yeah, it wasn't really just a spontaneous, like you do this, you do that. And like, so, I mean, for me personally, like I was very content with my roles. I loved what I did. Um, and uh, yeah, I would not, I would not have changed what I well, did. Well, let's tell everybody, what were your roles? Uh, okay, start with me. Uh, so I was the uh, boat carrier, uh, as well as Tim, who's not here. Uh, so I can, I'll just speak on his behalf. So him and I were the two boat carriers, and then on the campsite, I was the uh, fire maker. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was the uh, the navigator. Um, you know, I, I did all the stuff in the maps and whatnot, and said, "Oh, we're going this way, or we're going that way, or the portage is there, maybe." Um, <laughs> sometimes it wasn't there but yeah. <laughs> um sometimes there's no portage at all it's just you know we just schwack through the woods but uh i i carried the uh double pack so i carried like um you know a pack and then a smaller pack which had like uh tent poles and like propane and crocs and other miscellaneous items in it and then uh when nolan broke his arm um Callan and George and I split boat carrying for the last little bit of the trip. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was pretty much my role, most of navigation, I'd say, yeah. Yeah, wow. How about you, George? Uh, yeah, so my role during the day, I was uh, carrying the Wanigan. Yeah. So I that on every portage. And at night, I was the chef. So I made dinner and breakfast and lunch for the boys every day. Okay, I, ha I have mm -hmm. to ask, though, before we get on to Kaylin and Jacob, why a wanigan? Why, why why did you use a wanigan as opposed to like food barrels or or uh, you know another big pack or something along that lines? Uh, so at Camp Onik, we've always used wanigans, and I personally I've carried a wanigan before on a forty two day canoe trip, and I just really liked it. Uh, I think for efficiency when we're in the boat and we want to in a big lake, we don't have to take everything out of the boat. You can just open the wanigan face up like that and do lunch right there, mm -hmm. having that portable kitchen. But also I think just following tradition and the way like people have been doing it for a while. It just seemed kind of like the way for us to do it. Sure. Cool. And what, what's that made out of? I know it's made of wood, but like, is it a lightweight wood or is it, uh, what's uh yeah, the wood is fairly lightweight <laughs> on its own when it's empty. It's pretty nice to carry, but you can, like, <laughs> propane, a couple 
pots, cast iron pan, and a few bottles of sauce when it gets a little heavy. But. Yeah. yeah, come on, boys, eat. Make this thing lighter for me. Right? <laughs> Uh, Calvin, what about you? What was your? Uh... Yeah. Um, so during the day, I was the barrel carrier, and um, I also worked on uh, filming. So I was trying to organize every day where our cameras were, where they charge at the campsite. I would set up solar chargers and um, everything regarding the filming side of our trip, and uh, you know, managing throughout the day, like. You know, we're out there for a while. We don't have any plugs to plug our stuff into. So you find that best time of sunlight, take out the solar panels from the barrel, lay them out. I almost brought a tear to my eye saying that because it brought me right back. I felt like I was in the bow of our boat again. But, you know, <laughs> laying it out and getting our electronics charged so we could film this trip and show it to you guys. Wow. And how about you, Jacob? So I was the uh, pack carrier, so I'd carry like a pack and then paddles and life jackets during the day. And then on the, uh, when we got to the campsite, I was the uh, fisherman. Okay, so yeah, you caught that monster pike there, there that you had to beat yeah. up. Yeah. That was yeah. definitely the highlight catch of the trip. Definitely the biggest fish I had. That was cool watching the excitement and all you guys standing there jumping around screaming. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you got him, man. What Jacob's not mentioning, though, is his pack was like, wider than he was man it was like because willie v yeah. had two packs right and then jacob just had this one like really wide pack that was donated <laughs> to us from Kalani outfitters and Big it was pack. like it was huge man it was yeah. crazy he was uh, at level wow. six uh, yeah 130 liter or something 140 liter <laughs> <laughs> like Big boy what? Watching Jacob like trying like just walking up hills with that was just it's it just mind boggling. Like you're waiting for him to roll backwards, right? <laughs> it looked like the pack was eating him as you go, <laughs> like a turtle. <laughs> so, so, is that, so is it safe to assume then uh, T Tim was the uh, the camp cook? Oh, that was, that was, that was, that was you. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. With the one again. So what what was it? What was the favorite meal that uh, George's was cooking? Was there something in particular you guys really liked, or something you said, "Dude, don't cook that again"? <laughs> I remember <laughs> really like mac and cheese. Best yeah, <laughs> mac and cheese is great. And spaghetti too. Like I, I've never had spaghetti ever at any restaurant in my entire life. <laughs> it's just really good at spaghetti, and that that's not an exaggeration. I'm completely serious. George makes the best spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah. I mean, we, had, we had like a weird tradition that we developed, which is that like at the first day of every food drop, we would find our mac and cheese meal <laughs> and it right away. There was like no question, no doubt, for it, yeah, we're having our mac and cheese. And then the rest of the time, we'd be wishing we were eating mac and cheese. So, you know, George will make, uh, uh, you know, the worst trip meals into, you know, some five star quality. Yeah, um, a little imagination, right? It could go a long way, right? With that kind of thing. A little trip spice, you know? yeah. Yeah. And how, how many food drops did you guys have along the way? Did you uh, was it was it like a weekly thing or? Uh, we had five weeks, usually we we had four of them, right? Yeah, it's five yeah. Seven trip, four food drops. Uh, each you know each segment was like ten to sixteen days. I think yeah, sixteen days is our longest segment. Um, yeah, it, it was planned to be eighteen, and then it ended up being seventeen. Um, yeah. from there, yeah, but we, um, we started with our first one being 10, our second one being 18, third one, 13. I'm going to mess up the numbers as I go on, but then There's 10, 10 and 10 for the last three. I know the last three were all tens yeah. um, or the last two were tens, but yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> and who, who was responsible for doing the food drops? I know one, one of you, your father was like, had dropped you off up at Armstrong, right? And was was that your support team all the way throughout this thing? Like, what what was the support the parents, team like throughout the this? Were the, uh... Yeah, it was definitely the parents. Uh, so it was Tim's parents dropped us off in Wabakimi, and then it was George's. Uh, well, I'll say the families. And then George, George's sister and her boyfriend uh, did the food drop in Nipigon, and then Danny did the food drop. Kalen's dad did the food drop in Shaplo. Um, and then my parents, my whole family, actually, my parents and my brother came up to, uh, uh, where was it, Espanola, and they did the Espanola food drop. And then George's dad did the food North drop North. in North Bay. And Tim's family was also there. Okay. Big turnout in North Bay. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So, what about, what about funding? Now, I, I heard you make mention there that like you know, front neck outfitters donated a pack. Uh, you guys, you guys got canoes from Novacraft Canoe. Uh, how, how how did you go about uh, grabbing these sponsorships or, or having having these uh, sponsors reach out to you? Was it them reaching out to you, or did you have to kind of go courting them? Yeah, not not a lot of people reached out to us. In fact, I think we got reached out to every single sponsor we did get. Um, and yeah, what that looked like was for, you know, two months, three months, just calling every single company I could think of and just saying, just pitching our, our trip. And, uh, some people laughed and said, good luck. <laughs> and, uh, and then other companies, which are crazy kids, <laughs> we're, we're totally in on it. And, um, I think, you know, if, if you have, a uh, we had two sides of it that were very appealing to, to people, you know, whether it's a sponsorship or whether you're just listening or hearing about our trip, which is that we were raising money for charity. And there's that aspect of it, which is, you know, very wholesome and also a very great cause. And then we also had the fact that we were doing such an intense canoe trip, something that hadn't been done before and something with a lot of, you know, uh, difficulty and it's like could they even do that um so yeah a big thanks to all of our sponsors helping us out um you mentioned an outfitter i think you misheard us we said Killarney outfitters just oh. want to make sure that's clear but yeah um the front neck i'm sorry yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's all good well, <laughs> well you know what hey, anytime throughout yeah. the show here if you want to shout them out you know what it's a uh, it's it's welcome to uh shout out your sponsors because if they did help you along the way they uh they deserve that notoriety and recognition right so by all means don't be shy when you're uh, mentioning your your sponsors um uh, did it get easier as, as the trip was going along like was somebody else out there trying to gain more sponsorship because i know along the way you guys had all kinds of tv appearances like cbc radio cbc tv um, yeah so uh, how did all that come about did, just on, on uh, old sponsors uh just the only sponsor that did approach us instead of us approaching them was man rock mining <laughs> company in northern ontario so big shout out to them they kind of saved our asses on superior when we were stuck by the storm so i just wanted to throw that in there on the last point that, yeah. that was in your yeah. second video, right? In the second uh, episode. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. We, but while we we're on trip, you know, we're not, we weren't thinking about any of that. We were thinking about canoe trip. Um, we had people like uh, on the on the sidelines. Our family were helping out with, you know, like gathering that. I mean, you could speak on that, right? Yeah. So if I remember, it was uh, Tim's sister Abby was uh, helping us out a lot with. Uh, news and media relations she was always setting stuff up she'd text us or email us and be like hey when you guys are in this town there's these people and that kind of thing she did a lot of that stuff behind the scenes and managed the social media for us while we were out in the bush and uh, my mom also did a lot of emails and stuff like that and i think gathered up a few more sponsors while we were out in the woods yeah but at that point it was it was like uh we were already out there we were already facilitating the trip and um a bit of it came out of our own pocket at that point, but it was really cool to see that, you know, if you have, and this could be in any field or any category, if you have an interesting enough idea that's helping people out, people will want to help you to see it happen. And again, thanks to all the companies that sponsored us. And you can see it on our website at the end of our videos, all the list of them there. They wanted to see our trip happen and it wouldn't have been possible without them. Yeah, because with, with the charity, you, you guys had set out a goal of, what, $1,000 a day type of deal uh, yeah. trying to raise. Um, kind of hard to do when you're you're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and there's, like, nobody around. You can't really ask people for donations or stuff like that. But you guys ended up capping or exceeding the $60,000 uh, donation limit, um, which was, what, 80000 80, you said, somewhere around there? 84000 and something. Or maybe. Great, great segue. Open that up, which is that <laughs> we're working right now to open up our donations again and have them uh, running again because we've had so many people, new people have heard about the trip since our documentaries have been released. And um, they've been asking us, where can we donate? And we said, oh, we, you know, kind of closed donations a bit after the trip, but let's open the donations again. Let's have people who have just found out about us be able to donate to the cause um so within the next uh weeks we'll see our donation 
be back open again for sure. Um, but yeah, we reached I think eighty four thousand, which is when we uh, closed it at the at that time, and that was like stunning. I remember when we were paddling into Espanola, um, we were managing our food drop there, and uh, we had been out in the bush for and you know the hardest of our uh, of our trip in the darkest land, <laughs> and we um, we were paddling in, get service in Espanola, and we get a text from I think Tim's dad saying, "You guys did sixty thousand. You did it." And All right. you know, in the boats going, let's go. We finally made our goal and we're not even done the trip yet, you know? Yeah. Then, uh, Standing up in the stern of the canoe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Holding the phone up, trying to get a service. And I'm like, look, I'm like, all right, boys, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's awesome. Yeah. You know what? That's uh yeah, that's that's something Man. certainly to be proud of. I I commend you guys. That's awesome. Thank you know what? For such a great cause too, you know, uh, I'm surprised that they actually did close the window for, for donations, but you know what? That's not to say anybody in the chat, if you want to give to your local food bank, uh, you know what? They're always in need. You know what? It's always a great thing to do. Uh, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside when you, when you contribute to uh, some sort of charity that means something. Right. So, mm. yeah, that's awesome. And speaking on the food banks part there too, is that we were, you know, obviously food banks, Canada is where the money was going to, and that covers a wide spectrum of the country. But we did take 50% of the money that we raised during the trip and put it towards northern indigenous communities that are affected at most by, you know, that need those food banks the most, right? Mm -hmm. So we felt, you know, as a, it would only be fair if we're, you know, canoe tripping across, you know, their land. It would only be fair to find a way to give back. So that's where 50% of the money from food banks went and uh to northern communities in the northwest territories and uh yeah that's awesome that's awesome yeah you know what the, it, it's nice to spread the wealth right yeah so how how did you guys fund this trip uh obviously it's going to cost you money you know you, you got uh you got your support team driving around you have food and and you know gear that you weren't that that wasn't donated how, how did you actually fund this trip um I think most of it sort of came from like gear that we had. We had one sponsor who was like massive help, and that was uh, what's it called? Paddle Paddle for Adventures. And uh, <laughs> man, I met Rob Evis from uh, Paddle for Adventures. He uh, he like any of the gear that like we didn't have lying around like between the six of us because we had our own personal gear but any of that stuff that we didn't have rob evis came in he covered that for us and he uh he gave us like a first aid crash course as well and uh but as for the funding like a lot of the parents sort of just volunteered to do the food drops of their own volition so again like he showed to the families for being like, such an invaluable like support team and uh What's it called? As for um, like food, uh, we had GB Catering sponsored all of our sixty days of dry food. So we had to do wow. we had to pay for the food drops. That was one major expense, and the maps I think were another major expense. Or was it permits? It was permits. Yeah, yeah. It was big. Yeah. Permits were less than five hundred. So I think like it wasn't too bad. You split that between six people. It's like yeah. you know eighty ninety bucks per person. So it's not too bad. Yeah. Everything that wasn't covered by sponsors was sort of just out of pocket. Yeah, it, and it was a while ago, but I remember doing the math on how much, like, personally I would have spent on the trip divided between all the boys and, like, what I would have been paying. And I remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, I probably would have paid more money just on general living if I would have been in, um, you know, living in the city at home, just, you know, on food and whatnot. So, yeah. yeah. I, again, thanks to our sponsors, thanks to our family for helping out and and making it easier for us to go ahead and do it. But yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but it ended up being a very feasible thing to do. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how inexpensive uh, canoe tripping can actually be. You know, if you want to save money, go paddling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not spending it elsewhere. You're out there yeah. enjoying everything. Right. Stop paying rent. Get in the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just uh, go go homeless for, Actually, uh, for the summer. It's funny you say that. I remember when we were in Shaplo, in the town of Shaplo, <laughs> uh, Tim got a call and he picked it up and he put it on speakerphone 
And it was one of those uh, telemarketers calling about an air gut cleaning service. And they asked for the dimensions of his house. And he said, dude, I live in a tent. <laughs> forgot about that. Oh, forgot about that. That's beauty. That's beauty. Oh. Look, I'm going to take a couple of questions out of the chat here because I'm way behind in the chat, but I've had my finger on one here for a little while. Uh, Sue from Sue's Outdoor Crew is asking, did you experience any trail magic on your trip? I don't know what trail magic is. Yeah, think dry. So. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, if you yeah. can yeah. what trail magic is, that would be amazing. I have two things in which I think it could be. Please specify that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 that, that's why I put my finger on this one here because like it, it's one of those things. I wanted to see your reaction be like you know, you guys are on this on this on these portages. Like, uh, was there anything out there that really bewildered you? Uh, something that that just kept you like yeah. totally awestruck? Uh, that sticks oh, the mountain, the mountain, yeah, mountain goat portage. That was absurd. It's not the one with the rope going down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We should be giving away too many, too too many details because we want people to watch the videos by all means. Right? Yeah. But, well, uh, that 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 was wild. We yeah, I remember yeah. one experience that like made me laugh quite a bit was we were portaging to get to the town of Chaplo, and we hadn't seen a bear on our entire trip. And we looked <laughs> down this hydro line, and there was just a black bear roaming about you know. 200 yards away and so we stopped and and tim was further ahead and tim you know kind of kept uh going with the canoe and didn't realize that the bear was there but we uh we all stopped and looked at it and got a good look and just kind of admired the beauty of it far enough away knowing that it wouldn't be a problem also it's a black bear so not really too much of an issue anyways and then we start you know get our packs on and head over to where tim was and it had been like maybe 15 10 minutes and tim get, sees us come around he's like where were you guys like i've been waiting you know so long and we said oh there was a bear and he goes oh. <laughs> where, where? <laughs> it's pretty funny. Did, did you have many many more uh, animal encounters uh, throughout the trip we we had a few we saw a surprising oh, number of like bald eagles we saw yeah. a few moose um yeah, I mean, there wasn't, like, a ton of, like, wildlife that, but to be fair, like, a lot of our days, we were, like, really just trying to push kilometers. Like, we weren't really, like, sitting and, and you know, looking for wildlife, so I think that's part of the reason why we didn't see a whole lot of wildlife, but we definitely did, definitely did see some. And you weren't wildlife. all the quietest crew out there either, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know what I mean? You guys are all barking at each other, so I'm sure uh, yeah. you might you might have scared away a few animals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 100. <laughs> percent forget where it was, but we saw there was this really cool shot. I know it's on the Instagram, but we were going down a rapid. I think it was me, George, and Nolan, maybe. Darth and we saw a moose right at the end of the rapid when we were going down. There's a yeah. shot of it, and that was definitely like a highlight for me. Yeah, that, that was like, a Kimi River, I, I believe. I believe yeah. I took the photo, right? Yeah, I think we're in the yeah. back in the middle and i took that photo yeah the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in the start, start right? of the video yeah. i like i think kaylin was like filming and i'm like yo like put the photo away or something <laughs> yeah. and he gave go down video. we're yeah. about to yeah. go down a set of rapids <laughs> and he's like filming and then we shot the rapids <laughs> yeah so you guys uh when when you were traveling i know you mentioned earlier on you're trying to pump in about 35 kilometers a day type of thing. Uh, Wilderman, uh, Wilderman Northern Adventures asking how long do you guys travel most days and what was your hardest day? You guys must have run into a couple of days that were just like, yeah, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, the length of the days varied a lot. 35 is an average, but that doesn't mean a normal day is going to be 35. Um, it really depends. Like, you, you know, personally, I think the hardest day of the trip was the day that was only about like what like what would you guys say it was six kilometers seven kilometers on Jacob's birthday, yeah, seven k hardest day of the trip. Brutal. Yeah, it's it's okay. as a crow flies, uh, hardest day of the trip. Um, yeah. and I'll I'll get to that in just a moment. But um, yeah, our days uh, varied a lot in length. I mean, our longest day was eighty four kilometers. Uh, on Lake Nipigon, uh, we crunched most almost all of the lake in that day. Um. But yeah, like usually, usually a day would be like mid to high 30s and then you get like a food drop day or so where it's only like, you know, five or 10 or something every couple of weeks. But uh, mo most days were well over 30K because uh, in, in 
in a provincial park or any area where there are actual marked portages, like we're efficient enough that 35 to 40, even 45 wasn't that bad for us as, you know, normal day on the job. Um, hard to say the trip. Uh, I, I feel like the rest of you guys will want to pitch in here. So I'll, I'll be quick with, uh, what I think about it. But, um, yeah, so, uh, when planning the route, there's this tricky part where, um, as you see the way that the way everyone goes from Lake Superior to Lake Huron, Georgia Bay, they, they, they go through the St. Mary's River, but I, I, I thought, you know, that's kind of boring. I don't want to be on the big lakes all the time. Right. Just looking at the same thing. Right and dealing with wind and whatnot. So um, I wanted to go inland, you know, meet, meet all the interesting people there, see all the interesting stuff. And uh, the problem with that is, though, when you go inland, you do have to cross over a watershed from where all the rivers are going towards Hudson Bay and to where they're all going towards, um, like, northern Lake Huron. And uh, there's this area that we, uh, we call the Great Dry, you see. And it's just an area where there's, like, no water. It's just trees and, like, swamp. So we had sort of like a, a three-day portage, you see. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the, the second, the first day of that wasn't too bad. It was all mostly on road and like, a, like an old, like unmaintained hiking trail. The second day of that was like actual living hell. Like I think that day was six or seven kilometers, but hands down hardest day of the trip. We camped on this like little like unmarked ATV trails, unmarked on all of our maps. I had no idea it existed. We just stumbled upon it. And uh, we weren't even on like a body of water of any kind. We were drinking water from this this rusty pipe coming out of the ground. We were trying to filter <laughs> the coffee filters that were breaking, and we were able to drive <laughs> up the pipe filled with water, and like we're throwing off with tabs in it and shaking it. it was just, <laughs> the whole thing was just absurd. Like, I've, I've never, never once in my life canoe tripping, I've ever not stayed on a body of water. It's just, <laughs> it was just it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, that, was, that was definitely the hardest day, I think mentally, just because that, that bushwhacking was so dense. I mean, I walk around forests here where I'm <laughs> now in Pembroke, and I'm just, oh, I look at it and I'm like, that's a dense forest. But people don't understand when I say dense forest, you know, the bushwhacking we did in the Darklands. Again, like it took us our longest, hardest day, the most effort we put into it. We only got six or seven or eight K. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, uh, I think uh, Wilderman Northern Adventures, you asked a question. Did you guys, um, 80 kilometers in a day, the wind must have been behind you. Were you sailing? Uh, was there was no wind, no sailing. It was all paddling. It was, it was pretty, pretty much, much like flat dead, day. flat, like yeah. zero kilometer. Uh, I think it's in episode one. You can see, like, the water's like a mirror. Like, there was mm-hmm. no wind at all that. It was a hot day, and we ran out of sunscreen, too, so we had to, like, set up. <laughs> That, that, that was funny. That was, that, that was kind of funny. I know it's. I know it's serious. And you're out of sunscreen, but you hard. guys are all like all layered up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the funny part too. Is like just looking back on those first days of the trip when you're when you're at the later parts in the sag, and we were like, "Who wants sunscreen? I'll take some. Do I need it? Yeah, who knows? But just to be safe." And then like at the end of the sag, we're just like all. Huddled up with our shelter, I'm just paddling, thinking about the sunscreen I used, <laughs> and like wishing I had some. Then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the next seg, we just had so much sunscreen, but we didn't want to use it for fear that we'd run out. And we just had like an excessive amount of sunscreen in our impact. Yeah. I think almost every paddler's experienced that in some way, shape, or form, right? Where you're out there, and whether you have sunscreen on or not, the sun just pounds on you, right? And at, at some point, you have that breaking point where you say, "I just got to cover up," whether you got sunscreen on or not. So, yeah, yeah. That's, you got you guys were happy to get it then. I, were you able to communicate ahead to to tell on your next drop, "Hey, we need a lot more sunscreen than what uh, we had." Yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes, like it was slightly difficult because, like. It really depended on our like cell reception, um, but we also did have our sat phone with us. So if we were kind of like near the end of a seg and we needed something, we could like sat phone. But we, I think we did that like once maybe, and I think it was for Will's eye. It wasn't for like a thing that we needed because most of the time we had like a day or at least a couple hours at the food drops where we could like run in grab whatever we needed from like a grocery store in a town right like if we're going to nipigan chapelo espinal like there's small towns given but you know like they have grocery stores really there's there's definitely places we can go in buy what we need to and and 
proceed as we were. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilderman, he's got, he's got a lot of good questions here tonight. He's asking, uh, did you guys stick within a couple kilometers of shore or did you go farther out into open water on big lakes? I know you guys were a little worried about your crossing a Lake Nipigon, weren't you? It, uh, yeah, so it, it kind of depends on uh, the weather. We'd sort of feel things out. But uh, yeah, generally we try to stay close to shore. Like all of us have experience on like small lakes, small water. Um, we we didn't have canoe skirts or buoyancy tanks or any of that like you know like big lake type of gear. Um, but yeah, for Lake Nipigon before we did like there was one part where we did a sixteen kilometer open water crossing from uh, um, Wilson Island or Calvin Island um, to to another island farther south. And uh, yeah, we we phoned up Bruce Heyer and he uh, he phoned up the uh, local aviation service to ask about the wind for that day. So uh, we 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 had confirmation that the wind was going to be very light for several hours. So that's why we decided to do it. If if we didn't know that, you know, we may have been a little bit more hesitant about doing such a crossing. And then with Lake Superior, we pretty much island hops. But um, yeah, we uh, we got stuck on an island at one point because uh, a lightning storm rolled in. And after that, we we shore hugged. We weren't doing any more island hopping. After that. A great example of that is, yeah, like when we got stuck on that island, right? Because like that 16-kilometer gap across the dead center of Lake Nipigon like, was a way bigger gap than the 6-kilometer gap from Fur Island to the north shore of Superior. But because of the weather, like we were like, it's really just completely unsafe and like irresponsible to like shoot it straight across like <laughs> and, and it was like a cold it was a much colder day that day on uh superior as well so like that also played a big factor like with the day we had on nipping it was like literally the most perfect weather like we could not have asked for better conditions to make a crossing of that size so yeah. when, you, when you guys are doing those big crossings did you stick fairly close to each other or was it because I, I noticed a, a few scenes there in the uh, videos where you know some of you were on shore for quite a while, and then a couple of you would come like meandering in, uh, you know, obviously behind the game a bit. Were you guys sticking closer or like you know tighter together when it was uh, those critical conditions? Well, it uh, it looked like we were quite far apart, like you know, like a, a couple hundred meters on the video on the camera. It looks like it's really far away, but in reality, like in a canoe, uh, especially with three guys in a canoe and we're moving, like you know. Um, if we really need to, we can be going up to like 15 kilometers an hour. So like, you know, being, having the boats 500 meters apart really isn't that big of a deal. Like if, if, you know, one boat tips all the other guys and the other boat would certainly get there in like probably a minute or two at most. Um, it, it just looks far, but it really isn't that. And, and for those difficult crossings, we did stick together um, for the most part. Um, and yeah, like we only really did it when we were severely scared. So the Nipigon crossing, although that being a big crossing, having completely flat water, it was just routine for us, right? But on Superior, yeah. there was moments where we were like very worried about the water. <laughs> and stayed. We always, it's always probably as close together as we ever did on trip on that big water. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Well, yeah, you got to stick together, right? Jacob, uh, good friend here, uh, Mr. Callan, is asking how many times you puked on a portage. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a uh... great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, honestly, too many to count. It was uh, it was a brutal day or two. I don't know what happened. Maybe I drank some bad water, but I was just throwing up nonstop for about a day or two, and it was just really? – Longer, longer? I don't remember. It was a long time. It, it was, was it would come and go. And um, yeah. the coolest part was too is like we would all like be like really concerned, like, hey, like you should maybe stop, like Jacob, you know, take your time if you need to. But once the puke got out, it was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> like, and you can yeah. look in his eyes and see in his face that like, you know, he 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 uh he was you know clearly still in a phase that he could be throwing up in the next minute, but it didn't matter. He, again, like we were talking about earlier, that dedication to get to the campsite, like Jacob had it harder than all of us and, and had that same mentality. Wow. That's really these songs. Great. Song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, I thought maybe Kevin was on to something else, eh? but you guys are young partiers <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can handle it. Right? What's the people on the trail, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> that's funny uh we're, we're dead quiet. i had another good question here and i i've lost it i will i will find it okay so throughout this whole journey 2000 kilometers is, is, is a pretty big undertaking i, I want to ask each of you individually what what was the most magical moment of this trip for you guys like what what stood out most to you what what, what will always stick in here uh like you know for your whole lifetime i know the whole adventure will but what's the one key thing let's start with jacob Oh, I gotta think about that well, one. That's a big one. There's a lot. Want of... to come back to you? <laughs> yeah, come back, please. Give me, a, give me a minute. Who wants to start? I'll, I'll. Somebody's prepared. I mean, I got, I got a top three. So for me, it was right uh, before the mountain goat portage uh, on, in Wadakimi. We're in this huge like. There, there was a waterfall coming down right because we're, we're on the on the Kopka River. Sorry, at that point. And there, there was like this big waterfall we just portaged around and it sort of led into this like beautiful lake and it was surrounded by these big cliffs and the water was just so beautiful and it was the most beautiful day and like the sun was shining down and there was, we found this little like it was spring coming out of the cliff and we like filled up our water bottles and it was just like this sense of just like the wild Wabiki. Like the reason we went to Wabikimi because we wanted to see like wilderness. We wanted to see a wild place. And that's exactly what we found. And that's what that moment sort of represents uh, to me. And then the second highlight was our second morning on Superior when we were paddling from Vert Island to Rossport when we woke up really early. Um, mm. And uh, we were paddling through this fog, fog as the yeah. sun was coming up. And we we're all kind of like a little delirious because we hadn't really slept because we went to bed like not late, but you know, we woke up at what three in the morning? Oh, like it's it's, two at least. It was outrageous. We woke yeah. up like we four hours of sleep, maybe. And um and we're paddling through this mist and we I was seeing like cities coming out of the mist and like some of the other boys were seeing like these like towers and like these futuristic cities. Right. Yeah. It was just it was a weird morning, but it was so beautiful. We were playing like some good music and uh, and yeah. Um yeah. I'll, I'll, I won't say my third one in case someone else wants to say it, I feel like it's a pretty popular one. So yeah, I uh I think for me, that moment was probably like, I just think of like a moment of, I was like, wow, like this is, you know, like that standout moment was probably at the end of a, so from the Mattawa River after we left North Bay, we went down the Mattawa River for a day and then we portaged 28 kilometers from the Mattawa River to Yosk in Algonquin Park. Yeah. And, uh, I did that with, uh, with Will. So the two of us were walking that portage together. <laughs> The whole time you're like oh man my legs don't even hurt like i feel great and, uh, <laughs> just having a great time the whole day really just like in the rhythm of things just talking about, uh, seven hours, six hours straight or whatnot yeah yeah until about the end of the day i remember the roads it stops being concrete and you enter the park and it turns into dirt right where the highway ends and uh i remember i got onto that road and my, my ankles started giving out and i started feeling like oh i don't think i'm gonna make it like these last couple hundred meters or whatever it is and this, uh, this young guy who was working in the park came by with a bunch of boats. He must have been working as an outfitter or something like that. And he stops and he takes a good look at Will and I and we're covered in dirt and really <laughs> tired. And we, like, it's obvious we've been doing something insane. And he looks at us and he's like, we're carrying our stuff. And he's like, where are you boys coming from? And we're like, oh, Matt, where are you? And he's just like, <laughs> and I remember that look on his face was just priceless. Uh, that was me for the rest of my life. Cool. He just couldn't understand why we would have done that. <laughs> You know what? You probably had a lot of people shaking their heads when it come when it come to you know oh, an yeah. adventure of this uh, undertaking for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there was a few, a f oh, almost every moment of trip. Right. Um, one moment that just stuck out to me right now is uh, actually when we paddled in on our last day. You no, know, it felt really weird. Everything just felt weird, and and you know, it, it's like. At that point, it just didn't feel like it was going to end. It felt like we were going to do this thing in Ottawa, say hello to all our uh, you know, family, and then just keep going. And I remember just after we left Parliament Hill, just really thinking, this sucks. I hate being in the city. This really sucks. <laughs> just looking around and thinking, this, I, I want to, like, I was walking back to our hotel alone. It just, it was like so weird. It was like from trip. 
two hours before just to you walking alone in a city. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was the worst feeling ever. And I never wanted to go back to that again. And I said, okay, that's what I'm never going to have again is uh, that feeling of canoe trip until I'm back out there. Right. And um, yeah, I was a uh, weird, weird feeling, but definitely a moment I won't ever forget. Wow. Crazy. How about you, Will? You got anything? Oh, uh, oh, there's all sorts of moments. Like every every single day, I can remember at least one or two little things that I'm sure I'll remember. You know, right until the day I die. Like you know, these memories last a lifetime. Um, but uh, I think like one moment in particular that uh, just you know off the top of my head that uh, that stands out to me was uh, actually pretty early on in segment one, uh, right when we finished the Kopka River. So um, the Kopka mm -hmm. River mostly has portages right until you get to uh, the highway between Armstrong and Thunder Bay. And that's where people, uh, the, the few people who go there and trip there and their canoe trips. But if you keep going farther along Kopka River to Nipigon, there's no portages along there because no one trips along there. So it's all just schwacks. We, we did our last bushwhack around the last set of rapids. The, at the bottom of the Kopka River is an early morning, sort of a silver day. And uh, we, we get onto this little body of water, this little bay. And there's pelicans there, of all things. So there's a species of pelican that lives on Lake Nipigon. Like, you know, fun fun fact there. Um, and we paddled out a little bit. And then as you slowly go around this corner on Lake Nipigon, like from this little bay at the mouth of the Kopka, you slowly go around this corner and the lake just gradually reveals itself and you just like the scale of the lake was just mind-boggling like you know obviously we went to superior and here on later in the trip which are bigger but it was, it was re it really hit me oh my god like oh, i'm on a 60-day canoe trip there's no <laughs> going back like i'm i'm out here and i'm gonna be out here for two months with these guys like it really hit me at that moment when we were we went around the corner and you could see to the horizon. You can't see the shoreline because of the curvature of the earth. That's how big Lake Nipigon is. It's just, wow. you see, it, it's like an ocean. It's like, if, you know, if you've been to the Atlantic or Pacific or whatnot, it's like, it's just, it's water as far as you can see with the islands dotting here and there. And there's this, there's this huge island right at the bottom of the Kopka called Barn Island. And it's just this vertical, like, pillar of rock just rising out. And there's these other huge pillars of rock off in the distance. I thought that was really neat about Nipigon. So there's all these cliffs and strange just like very vertical islands it's 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 incredible it's such a strange and surreal place to be it's it's yeah. so bizarre but um it, it makes you feel really tiny because everything is just so massive that that island the first island we saw it looked like it was you know like not that far away we thought oh, we'll be there in like 10 minutes and it took us like an hour to get there because everything was so big you just yeah. feel like an ant, and it really like put things in perspective for me that like you know, there's this whole world out there, and like all of us and all our problems and stuff are just like so small, and in comparison, it's just it, it was really humbling experience. It's it just crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, one of the one of the experiences, like the the moments I felt that same kind of way, like geez, like how long have we gone? Is uh, when we got to the end of the Spanish River. And we were at Agnew Lake where it meets the Spanish River. I remember looking around and I've never been to Scotland, but I, I've seen photos, right? And yeah. I remember looking around and <laughs> like, this does not look like Canada. This area just looks like some other, this looks like where they filmed the Lord of the Rings, you know? <laughs> and then, yeah, well, that's New <laughs> Zealand. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I remember thinking to myself, geez, we were in Nipigon completely different landscape and it kind of gave me an idea we've traveled so far we've kind of gone through a different biome in a sense yeah we and, have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, crazy. Wild. that's crazy yeah you know what I, i've been there a couple times myself down to agnew there when i've done the spanish river and come to think of it yeah it does kind of have that look and feel about it down there right <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah okay jacob we made a background full circle all right let's go um <laughs> I don't know what I about it um honestly the boys brought up a lot of memories i had forgotten like lake superior for example as nolan said and like one day we were going on this uh we were paddling in the fog and i think i was just so sleep deprived so tired that 
myself at least i started seeing yeah like cities i saw like sky the skyline of toronto in like the clouds or at least i thought it was that and i was just so surreal it was just such a surreal moment i don't even believe it happened at this point i just remember being in like awe and i just was listening to music paddling my my butt off going as hard as i could and it was just like a magical experience to be honest i was so like just lost in my own head and then when I came back to it, I was like, wow, like, this is what I'm doing and I love it. And it really was like a moment for me in the trip where I realized like, yeah, like, I love this and I want to, you know, be here till the end of it. Cool. Very good. Yeah. Okay, guys, you know what? We're, we're at the eight o'clock hour. We're past there. I'm just going to do my swag giveaway. <laughs> then I'm going to invite some people. Uh, if anybody wants to join us here on panel, I'm dropping the link in the chat right now. Uh, if you have any question for the boys, and you know what, I'm just thinking of it now. We should have right, at, right, right off the get go of the show. We should have had a bit of a drinking game going tonight. There, where you mm -hmm. know, every time we said the word boys, everybody had to pop one, right? So, but uh, a little late. But you know what, we can start playing that now if you want. Uh, <laughs> these yeah. guys are well warmed up. That's all right. Cheers to y'all. <laughs> Actually, I'll be cracking mine as soon as I'm done the swag giveaway. But if anybody wants to pop on screen, ask these guys any questions. Uh, I know I, I missed a lot of the questions to, to pull them into the chat tonight. But uh, now's your opportunity. I'm just going to put all you guys in the green room for a second. Great chance to go for uh, a men's room break. And uh, I'll be right back up with you. Uh, I'll pull you back up as soon as I'm done the swag giveaway, okay? All right. Julia B., this one's for you. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> be right with you, guys. All right. So you know what, guys and gals, so far so good. These uh, these guys are pretty amazing. This uh, this this trip that they undertook is uh, just fantastic. Um, what we're going to be doing today is going to be giving away a Canoe Hound Adventures prize pack. Um, as usual, we're going to be giving away some uh, some decals and some uh, some patches. Uh, supplies are getting low on these. If anybody wants these things, now is your chance to try and win them. You know, uh, they're uh, they're getting low. I don't know when I'll be doing another batch because it'll probably change up to something different. But they're they're up for grabs tonight, as well as uh, some uh, stuff from Algonquin Outfitters. We got a couple of vouchers or a voucher and uh, a decal from them. And that'll go to the lucky winner of this week's swag question winner. Uh, what we need you to do, please, is please do not put, do not, I repeat, do not put your answer in the chat. What I need you to do is email your answer across to coasprize at gmail.com by Saturday at 11. Uh, and at that time, I will uh, I will draw from the winner. I will let you know, too, if you actually submitted the correct answer. And just as a reminder, at the end of the season for Canoe Hound, second season, i uh, going to be doing one huge giveaway. Details are to come. But for every time that you actually enter into any of the week's swag giveaway draws, you're automatically entered with that there. So many of you already have several entries. Some of you may not have any. Start now. You can't win if you don't have a ticket, right? Tonight's question is, what's the distance of this epic canoe trip and how many days did it take to complete it? Very simple. It's right in the title of this uh, this uh, video here on YouTube. So what is the distance of this epic canoe trip and how many days did it take to complete it? I'll leave that on screen for a second. I'm going to get the boys back up here. Once again, if anybody wants to join us on screen, here is the link. Please do come on up. Uh, these guys would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, with that being said, we'll get uh, Nolan and Will up. We'll get Kalen and George's up. And we'll get Jacob up. Back in the same order we had you guys. Yep. Everybody good? Oh, yeah. We lost George. Hey, he's on a washroom break right now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was loading back up. And this is my chance to uh, join you guys with a little serial killer tonight. So, uh <laughs> Yeah. Why? Well, can you explain that? You're going to join us with a serial killer? With a serial killer, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's one of my favorite oh. brews from a local uh, brew house here in my area. And uh, yeah, cheers to you, boys. Thanks for coming on the show tonight. Cheers. 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 That, I said the word boys, eh? So that's. Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I've seen this question. Kevin popped this on. He probably didn't ask you this in his uh, his uh, fireside chat that he had with you guys. Uh, go back, and everybody in the chat, if you haven't seen Kevin's uh, fireside chat with these guys, by all means, go check it out because uh, he covered a lot of questions that I haven't covered tonight. But Kevin's asking, what was the one moment you missed on camera that you wish you really got? Um, I would say from two things. From an editing perspective, everything where it's like, 
like I wish we had taken more time to like step back and film, you know, like everyone's doing something and then one guy's just filming because a lot of the footage is like, you, you know, like because we we're trying to like push so far in each day, like, you know, you kind of just have a GoPro strapped to yourself, click it on, record, and then you just kind of keep doing what you're doing, right? That's what a lot of the footage was. But like, I wish we had a bit more like set up shots and like I realized it's like not super realistic because like that would have hindered how far we could have pushed in a day. But like more shots like that would have been great. Um, and but as far as like specific shots, I'd say Will, uh, like the time that he mentioned when we were going around the bend into uh, Lake Nipigon, there's really not a great shot of that because it just took. As he said, the scale of the lake, it took so long to round that bend. It was probably, and I kind of like cut it up when I was editing it. So it's kind of, you could get a sense of the time passing, but it was like, it was a solid, like, it's like half an hour yeah, going it's around a that solid bend. Half hour it's long. Grand, it's yeah, just like, rising over the horizon. And there's no way I could like put that in the dock. So, like, and it was also like, you know, it was a chest mount GoPro, was where that shot was taken from. So it's kind of like you're getting the hands in the frame and there's a lot of like, it just wasn't a great shot. You know, like I wish, I wish we could have like taken a moment as we were kind of coming around the bend and really just sort of done like a pan of the scenery and really captured the essence of that moment. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And you, but uh, was it Jacob, you were the camera guy or one of the camera guys? Was it you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. We were all camera, camera guys on the trip. But yeah. So who, whose GoPro got lost? <laughs> yeah, it, it was a borrowed GoPro. Sponsor, Raw. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsor, Rob Evans. <laughs> With so much and <laughs> GoPro, and you're uh, sorry. <laughs> that one's in the bottom of uh, Smooth Rock Lake in Wabakimi. Um, if we have any scubas in the chat, scuba divers that are are very avid, you uh, <laughs> want to collect that footage. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's some good footage in there. There's some there great footage. In there. I was going to say, did you lose some good Kevin, footage? you asked the question, what's some footage we missed or what's something we missed we filmed? A lot of cool footage up there in that GoPro of us on the drive up. Um, day one and two. Uh, day yeah, one and two. Bad. The meaningful talks we had with our um, with our drivers, right? So Tim's dad and Tim's uncle, um, our buddy Tyler and uh, Ralphie. Ralphie. And uh, we filmed a lot of the conversations we had there. And um, on a personal stand, it would be great if we had that. But who knows? Maybe one day we'll go diving for it. You know, if, if anyone here is, you know, has the equipment and whatnot, just uh, contact me. I can show, like, I have the exact spot on a map. The exact, <laughs> point, the exact day I know just where you should go in. So um, uh, contact me and I'll uh, I'll send you the coordinates. Go out there and get our GoPro. That that would be great. Yeah, yeah uh, probably by that time I'm sure it's going to be breached anyways. The water and everything will be all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <man. Who knows? laughs> so what, what exactly happened there? Uh, how, how did that uh, that come about? The thing up there? Uh, everybody <laughs> looking at Nolan. <laughs> no, so pretty much like uh, we had these rigs, these like GoPro rigs. And they would like screw onto the gunnels. And so I've been using them for the first couple of days. Like I would like get it on the gunnels and like screw it on. And I would like use it to record myself so I could be paddling and still have like a still well framed shot of myself <laughs> as I was like paddling. So I could like talk to the camera and like whatever, just have like, you know, like tell people what's going on in the moment. Versus having it like rigged up to my chest or my head. And pretty much it was like rigged up to like the gunnel. And I like, we stopped for breakfast and I like swung my paddle over to like put it behind me. And I hear this like plop in the water. And I'm like, oh no, what just <laughs> fell in the water? And I just like, smack, like I just, apparently, I guess I just like baseball batted the GoPro into the water with my paddle and my. <laughs> Yeah, the end of that GoPro, but <laughs> we went diving, but no success. Yeah, in all honesty, it wasn't Nolan's fault. Like as as we said earlier, none of us had ever canoe tripped and tried to film at the same time, you know. And like we thought the uh, GoPros would be a bit more secure to the boats, mm -hmm. but um, you know yeah. things happen. It isn't an adventure if everything goes according to plan. So uh, yeah. 
And, and thank God that happened on day two and all like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. like that could have been so much worse. Yeah. yeah. I remember being like kind of devastated on day two. I was like, oh no. And then to think like, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, we still pull it together. Could, could have, if it's any consolation, you can read this comment, you know, because there's been many, yeah. I'm sure there's been quite the sizable investment of GoPros in the bottom of lakes. Yeah. Yeah. GoPro of the, yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was like, I don't know, as Will said, like, yeah, it was just a matter of if anyone was wondering why we didn't have any of those like facing the person shots in like later episodes that's why it's because we realized that that rig was like super unreliable because the second time we lost the gopro it was the same thing i had the rig on the back of my boat on the gunnel uh, on a portage and like it just got knocked off by like a thin little like branch like a couple leaves just like knocked it off it was like they were really like not great rigs so we just learned to like we can't use them we tried like stringing them up we tried everything but we were just like yeah. Those the ones so you know like uh, learn and adapt and we just moved on didn't use those rigs anymore the, re the reason why i was asking is because you know what people could probably learn learn a lesson by uh <laughs> yeah. your mishap there that you know yeah. what to use and what not to use right yeah. don't strap the gopros to the gals yeah uh, Dennis, do, you mind, yeah. do you mind highlighting um kevin's comment right there which is you seem to meet a lot of guardian angels along the way that's really cool trying to do it in the Kevin voice. Um, who were the highlights? All right, boys. Who were the highlights oh. <laughs> when we met? Oh, so Bruce, Bruce, just Bruce Hire. Nick? Yeah, Bruce Heyer, definitely um, number one on that list. Um, he helped us out exponentially with, with the the route planning for our Wabakimi segment, as well as coming Something in to help out Will with Sai, as well as just being an awesome person and being – you know, super inspiring and, and uh, yeah. And then progressing there, trying to go down route from our trip. Um, Even Howie, 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 Howie uh, that's what I was thinking. So Howie, uh, don't know what's last name. In the town of Nipigon was this, there's this man who just, who would sit at the bench there in the town of Nipigon when we uh, were on the drive up, we met him. And then when we were coming back down, he was there as well. And then the next day, and that's just his, that's his thing. He sits on that bench and just looks at the water and he had so much knowledge about the area. He had done what we were about to set forth on Superior and uh, was such an interesting person to talk about. Hmm. Yeah, we, we told Howie about our 60, I remember talking to Howie about our 60 day canoe trip. And then he started talking to me about his 90 day canoe trip. Like, Jeez, all right. And this guy um, didn't bring food on his. He just brought a big bag of rice. Yeah, he hunted. Animal. He, like, he caught his own Savage. people along the way. Like, like you know, we oh, man, Jacob. like we're, we're doing some amateur stuff compared to this Howie guy. <laughs> yeah. What was the longest trip that you guys have done? I know you mentioned through the camp there, it's kind of tradition to do a 50-day trip, but was this 60-day your longest trip, guys? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's the longest for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Any any plans of doing another big, uh, another one well, of these big deals? Or yeah, we we don't have any like you know anything set in stone, anything like you know in cement. But uh, I I have uh, I have been working on a a few different potential routes which uh, could be could be used in the future. Um, stuff in uh, northern Quebec between James Bay and the Atlantic, and uh, um, stuff in. Uh, uh, southern Nunavut, Northwest Territories. I've, 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 I've got a whole bunch of routes in the planning. Whether or not they'll happen, I, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. That's cool. But, Will, this route was a route in the planning, right? I bet you never imagined we'd go on this, right? So, but who knows? Who knows what's to come, right? And, maybe um, next time we'll, we'll – I don't know. Maybe we'll start in Yellowknife and then go to Ottawa. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like one, one days. Thing there is we'll never stop canoeing, right? Oh, yeah. So. yeah. That's all right. You know, when it's in your system, eh, it becomes a part of you uh, tripping. It, a lot of people don't realize that if they've never done it. So when you're out there and you, you get to live it, and you know, when you could go days without seeing people, it's not very often in your lifetime you could say that you go days without seeing people, right? Because there's always people around. Yeah. 
So any time during this this entire trip, what, did any of you have this thing? Like, you know, was there a part where you were paddling along saying, man, I wish this stretch would finish? Like, you know what I mean? Like, are we ever going to get there? Smooth <laughs> definitely rock, Lake Michigan for me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man, this is yeah. vicious. Oh, no. Another time. I'm actually, I was actually just editing this section today. It was, uh, it was in the third episode. I think it was day, um, 21 and I got heat stroke, like <laughs> maybe like three or four hours into the day. What day was that? Was that in Missinabi? Yeah, it was in yeah. Missinabi and we're doing this like cart trail. Oh, oh no. Oh. Little freeze. Oh. 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 <laughs> it's like it's not even the middle of a story, eh? Oh, that was brutal. It was the day we got to Bull Cow and we had like two schwacks leading up to this bull, uh, this cart trail portage. A damn logging road. And yeah. we did like a kilometer or two along the cart trail and I just like collapsed. Like, I just, like we, we didn't have any water because we were like on this cart trail and we like forgot to fill the last lake was swampy and like really gross. We didn't want to fill up our water there for fear of contamination. And so we ended up not having any water, and I ended up just like collapsing on this like dirt road. And then like the boys had all like kind of pulled together, and uh, you know, sort of went ahead, got some water, and I tried my best to like push forward. But yeah, and and then and then we still had like how long to go after that? Like it was oh, still like, it was, like a good twenty. Lake. We still had like four times, and it was exactly. yeah, and it was yeah. a lot of like lake hopping, and it was like. It was a. It was still like a really hard day after that. Day so like, was a whole. I remember yeah. we were eating lunch and Will's telling everyone like how much left. Yeah, five four times. And I'm just sitting there. And I'm like, oh <laughs> man, like oh no, like I, like I was just not having it. Hey, we that. did it, and we we got there reasonable yeah, we got time. There. Like we got we there got like there. five thirty p.m. or something. Like we we saw a daylight when yeah. we got there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, bull, bull cow, man. When you mentioned that lake there, that, that lake brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> You've been to bull cow? You've been to oh, bull yeah, cow? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Back when I've done Ooh. the uh, Mizunabi trip, we took the we, we got off the bud train one time and it dropped us off at the one kilometer portage in the bull cow. And then, yeah, you paddle down and head towards Anvil Lake, and it's yeah, you get into lake hopping there and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun back there. We uh, we we, we kind of did that in re re reverse. So, from Big Missinabi, we uh, we went up the Little Missinabi River to Little Missinabi awesome. Lake, and then yep. we, uh, we took this old, like, really unmaintained portage to this weird, like, abandoned cabin on yep. Ham Lake. And then from there, we went on to uh, the logging roads, which all lead Chaplow. We did like i don't know it's like a two or three k and it was it was burning hot but it was it was um it hadn't been maintained maintained in quite some time so it was a it's a good one kilometer schwack to all these like felled trees and whatnot in order just to get to the logging road which was the uh the real tricky part and then once we got in these little lakes you do the lake hopping get to bull cow and then from there we did the one kilometer portage to the train tracks and then a nine kilometer portage along the train tracks down to goldie lake Cause like, wow. And yeah. I was, I was complaining earlier today cause I was editing that day earlier today. I just finished editing that day. And, um, I was complaining how like I was like struggling to ca and, uh, capture the emotion of like right before that car trail portage. Cause there was like a solid, like 300 meters. We were just walking through these like raspberry bushes mm. and the thorns were like interlaced and like, Right, like I was carrying the boat, and so my hands are like on the boat, and I can't really like get the raspberry bushes out of my way, and so I'm just having to like soak the raspberry bushes. I'm just like kicking through these like thorns that are like lacing up, and they're just tearing apart my legs. And it was like so hot too, and it was just like I don't like nothing you're gonna like film is like gonna like capture like the emotion like the pain of that moment i was just like i was frustrated but i just wanted to make sure people knew that that was a hard day i uh <laughs> a really hard i day. scouted that portage so when we landed on the shore of that lake i went in alone just, you know on my own not carrying anything to get to the logging portage or sorry to the logging road in order to find it and make sure it still existed because like we you know the maps aren't always 100 percent reliable in northern ontario like Google Maps doesn't work in Northern Ontario, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, I went in alone. 
did this long scouting on my own, just just walking in there, even walking there to the logging road, and walking back to the lake to tell the boys without carrying anything. It was it was absolutely brutal. I got my legs and my arms all cut up by raspberry bushes, and it was just. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was so morally crushing to tell the boys, yeah, this is gonna suck. Like this is just this was awful without carrying anything at all. This is gonna be so much worse for you guys, like carrying boats and wagons and packs and barrels and stuff. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. Hey Jacob, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat right now, but Kevin's Kevin's picking on you again. Yeah, again, I <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> non stop with that guy, non stop. <laughs> Yeah. Any anybody else, or is there any other other things? uh, What was the worst portage uh, that you remember from trip? Because I know, like, we would all have different ways of getting through portages, and we all, you know, had different methods of like when it was really bad, how to get through. And Jacob honestly had the the most uplifting way, which is like whenever you hear Jacob give a grunt. And it was like this, this scream. It, it like it, it it made you scared, but you would push harder and and uh, he would give these like fires and and uh, just run, kind of explode when he was going over and bushwhacking and, and hiking over trees and stuff. So to Kevin, Jacob uh, might not be talking much, but on trip he would be very you vocal. know very vocal. Yeah, yeah. Very loud, yeah. <laughs> Did you guys? Did you guys have any like morale song or something that you sang out there or so, something that uh, like you know that you, that you paddle the rhythm rhythm to? You know, if you uh, if you ever heard of Froggy Fresh? <laughs> oh my god! Go ahead, sing it for <laughs> Froggy Fresh. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's this uh, there, there, there's this uh, little like five foot one guy from like Missouri or Alabama or something. We used to like make these uh these rap videos on uh, on YouTube and they're they're pretty entertaining and he went by the uh, he went by the pseudonym Froggy Fresh. Anyway, Froggy Fresh was the fuel that got us through the dark way. Froggy Fresh kept the morale up. He, on repeat. He, his yeah. music was a truly an inspiration to the board. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, man. Yeah. Froggy Fresh. I, I saw he did listen to a bit of Beethoven. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's true. That was good. Number five. Yeah, you in the you in the move when Beethoven's going. Number three. But, yeah. uh, I think uh Wilder Wilderman Northern Adventures asked, were we doing single carries? Every portage. I don't think we doubled back maybe like once or twice for some odd reason. But yeah, every portage, that's kind of why we had our own purpose, our own jobs. So that we can make sure that we efficiently were able to get on portages and and do them in one trip and not waste any time there. That's why we have three people per boat as well. Like you, 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 you know, it's very difficult to do uh, long segments with two people a boat and uh, get through on one one go. Um, the only times we double backed were like you know when like some sort of strange calamity would happen, like someone would get injured or something strange like that. But uh. You know, on a normal day, everything would be done in one run. There's no way to do such long days doubling back. We had to be all in one run. Especially with the very long portages, like uh, uh, we mentioned earlier, the 28K, like, uh, would absolutely not even been considered if we had to double back. So, Yeah, yeah. It's a, you carry single and you, you take your breaks as you need, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, on the trip while you're while you're doing this? Obviously, George has kept you guys well fed with the uh, mac and cheese and his fantastic pasta dinners. But what what, what was the thing you guys craved the most out there? Now, let's uh, beer is probably a given. But uh, yeah. <laughs> what's the, what's the thing you guys uh, craved the most out there? What did you? I, there was a day I was baking in the sun, like like I thought you know I felt like my skin was bubbling. I felt like an egg on a frying pan. Like it was it was dark. Like the the sun was just was beating me down. I hadn't had water in a few hours. You know, I was, I was starting to, my mind was starting to wander places. And I, I, I would have, you know, I would have done anything for an ice cream cone. On the portage in the dark lands, the, uh, the engineer I've dubbed this portage, so it goes past Engineer Lake from Engineer Creek. It was that like 12K along that car oh, trail. Do you remember? Oh, we we got the lake with the really oh, green water, the really like like cyan. Kind of place. Water. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was weird. But um, anyway, that portage, oh my God, I, I would have like, 
I would have given up my life savings. I would have like <laughs> like sacrificed my firstborn child. I would have done anything. <laughs> oh yeah. I, yeah. I know personally, uh, I'm I with you on that. That's my biggest craving when I'm out uh, on any I, any type of trip like that. The first thing I, you know, you get back in the car and you're driving home, you make that first gas stop, like right to the ice cream cooler, right? Because you don't have anything cold on canoe trip. Like, <laughs> yeah, the coolest thing you get, like you, you know, on a, on a somewhat chilly day, you'll get like lukewarm lake water or something. But like, <laughs> you can get anything frozen, you you can get heated things, you can start a fire. But like, there's the greatest achievement of humanity is creating like cool beverages and cool foods like like things that are cold that that that's truly the pinnacle of civilization uh, agreed agreed yeah, agreed yeah 100 percent. yeah got a question here for uh for nolan uh and it must be somebody yeah. kind of related to you or something with the uh, last name right yeah. <laughs> the dark lands that you thought you broke your arm uh, it was it was not. It was actually in Killarney, funnily enough. We were on like marked clear portages and uh, I, it was we were kind of going up this creek and um, we we're just going really fast. We were trying to get the day done quickly and we we're just in and out of the boats really quick. Short portages, like on all under 100 meters. And I was just did, doing things too fast. And I was kind of jogging the portage and I just like slipped, boat fell, landed on my arm. How's that? Jesus. But we don't want to give too much away because that's next episode, is it not? Uh, that's episode five. Okay. Or five or yeah. four. Yeah, yeah, five. No, that's, yeah. That's five. Yeah, it's pretty late into the trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do we haven't put in the whole like Sudbury fiasco. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I recorded some of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, uh, you'll, you'll see. Just, just wait. Just wait. You'll see. I'm, I'm looking. When, when's the next episode coming out? Um. So uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to release on the last day of every month. Right. Um, and uh, yeah. So that's the schedule that I'm gonna really try to stick to. Um, it's pretty hard because like there's a lot of like what what we're trying to do i don't know if you noticed with the second episode but tim actually narr narrated that one so we're trying to get a different person to narrate every single episode mm -hmm. so it's, it's a bit difficult also just coordinating with people especially uh virtually how, how to like get people sending in their narrations and stuff so that takes a little bit extra time and it's but but i should be able to stick to once a month on the last day of every month. So that next episode should be coming out on May 30th, I guess. I'm going to wait that long. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch it now. <laughs> Come on, get, get busy there, Nolan. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I, I really enjoyed the first episode. Really, really enjoyed the second episode. Now we got to wait that long. Jeez. I shouldn't have asked. I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I, I posted a couple times in the chat. And I'm just going to put the uh, opportunity out there one more time to anybody that might want to pop up on chat. Don't be shy. These guys are very personable, and they uh, they would love to uh, meet you. Come on. And, uh, Go on. Yeah, I know, right? Chat. Ask them, uh, ask if them. not, I, I'll get through a few more questions that I do have here, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll probably call it an evening. But uh, I want to get back a little bit more to um, the charitable aspect of the trip. Um, you know, how what was the ultimate decision to to choose Food Banks Canada? I know uh, you wanted to help out many people as many as you could, but why why that particular uh, charity? Uh, so we uh, we originally started off the idea was just we came up with the idea of like a canoe for COVID, and we wanted it took us a while actually to really narrow down on which charity we were going to pick. At first, we were thinking maybe we would split it into a variety of charities. And uh, at the time in the news, the thing that everyone was talking about was healthcare workers. So we were originally, our big plan was uh, we were going to donate this to healthcare workers. And then we kind of had the thought of, you know, it's, uh, it's what, it's March or April right now when we're planning this trip. Who knows? Like this virus only came about a few months ago. Who knows what June, July, August is going to look like, whether or not this virus will still be affecting the front lines and healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. So we thought no matter what, no matter if there's a virus or what time of the year it is, people always need food banks and it's always going to help people out. So we thought that that would be a really good choice. Okay. And, and where did, where did the, uh, the indigenous uh, communities come into play? How did that get broken into as far as, uh, 
saying let's let's take half and throw it that way too yeah we, we just felt it was important and um it is important and uh if we're going to be canoe tripping across a lot of uh, uh land that isn't ours and 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 we have to acknowledge that in some sort of way and and the way we chose was taking again that 50 percent and putting it towards those communities that are most affected right now and that that was important for all of us because it was a moment where you know we can't always portray that we're you know trying to help out with the certain circumstances that indigenous communities are in right now right we're canoe tripping we're on a canoe trip Mm -hmm. So we took that opportunity to give to the people we felt were most in need and as a thank you for letting us come across that land. And I'm actually wearing a hat right now that Sarah Blackwell gave me. Right, let's uh, uh, show that off again. Let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, from the Anishinaabek Nations. Sarah from North Bay, thank you so much. Uh, she just so happened to see us when we were portaging through and um, – a very lovely lady and uh, sat and talked with her about where we were planning on putting the funds and also just talked with her about um, the area and, and the land. And she gave us some hats and, and gave us good vibes for the future of the trip. So it was great. Did you, did you guys meet anybody that was, uh, we'll say very, very popular or somebody like, did, did you happen to meet the prime minister at the end of all this? Was he nice enough to come out and shake your hand? No, okay. Shame on you, Trudeau, right? We met the mayor of Ottawa, the mayor of North Bay, and the mayor of Espanola. Yeah. That was pretty any, cool. Any I, of the I little towns you come into? Did you have, like, the, the welcoming yeah. party? Yeah. And Rick and, Anthony. And, and um, Yeah, we, we met Rick Anthony as well. I'm just throwing that in there. Yeah, Rick Anthony was mm. really awesome to meet. And um, we uh, – in Espanola, I want to say thank you to the people in Espanola who – we're so kind when we got there to kind of host like a little uh, get together, like, you know, socially distanced, you know, they made a banner for us. We had just hit 60,000 and hit our goal right when we got into town. Cool. And, um, you know, my, uh, my aunt from Elliott Lake and my uncle John came out and, and, uh, and, and visited. And it was, it was a surreal experience to finally see like the first community along our trip that was fully aware of what we were doing, fully impressed by it. And then, yeah. And yeah, there was yeah. a lot of love in Espanola. They really came out and gave us a good time. It was awesome. Like, we get like, Espanola. Huge shout out to the Taylor family specifically. Like, yeah. you know, like they didn't even know us, but it was through sort of a camp connection. They reached out to us and they like set all of that up for us. Like it was really like they overextended themselves so much. And it was like such an incredible, uh, they helped us in just such an incredible way. You know, like they, they, uh, promoted us to their local uh, grocery store and the I, I believe the guy's name was Tanner. Tanner. Yeah. It was Tanner. Just, Tanner's uh, independent. Grocery store and he ran a fundraising campaign on our behalf in his grocery store and like uh, you know like they were there for us. They let us camp out in their backyard while we were staying in Espanola. Like they set us up really 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 nicely. It was you know just spectacular such like the true spirit of northern hospitality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Well Guys, I just got to do something here really quick. Just a quick little intro. Um, bear with me for one second, all right? Hi, I'm Kevin Cowan, the happy camper. Woo! Yes, I'm Apostle number 14. Well, if you visited me instead, you would have been fine. It's a one sexy beast, I'm telling you. No, I told you poopy pants, sorry about that. Did you really? <laughs> I will hold in my urine for you, Dennis. You have to remind Kevin that this is a family show. What about the chipmunks? Awesome. <laughs> Kevin. Oh, <laughs> was so no, was way. Funny, Kevin. no way. <laughs> oh. Hey, cheers, Kevin. Cheers, cheers, cheers. I, I, ha I have to say that uh, these young fellows were on uh, Kevin Callan's uh, Whiskey Fireside chat there about a week ago. And a fantastic show. I, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, learned a lot. Watched the videos, learned a lot, but learned a lot more through the, the video. So, what, what do you got here for us today, Kevin? Well, I'm working tonight once again, and I'm, I'm watching your show while I'm working, and, I, and this is more interesting than what I was doing. So, <laughs> um, hey, like, I'm the only one asking these guys questions. Like, what's going on? I know. Hey, everybody's shy. I got somebody else in the basement here. Let, let me invite this guest up, and then we'll finish off with uh, with you there, Kevin. Okay. okay. I, I, guys, I, I, 
I, I think they're all afraid of the youth. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, we were pretty cool. We're pretty yeah, cool. You, you guys yeah, are dangerous cool. people. You probably get arrested every night of the, of the year. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, 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 Kevin, because because we get away. <laughs> <laughs> Ari Rosen, how are you doing tonight? What? I'm doing really good, Dennis. How are you doing? Ari, and, uh, hey, frozen up. Kev, how are you doing? I think Ari's frozen you up. Guys okay, are... we'll go back to you, Kevin. Oh, I... oh what? Uh, what? What? Oh, Ari was there. He was there. Yeah. Hey, sorry. I'm, I'm there. Hey, oh, hey. how's it going, man? Cheers. Cheers. How you doing tonight, buddy? What's up? I'm doing good. I want to congratulate you guys on the, the whole thing that you did when you decided when camp wasn't going, you went with this COVID deal and you guys just traveled an awesome trip. Like it's the super OMG because th this is like, like you guys said, the trip that didn't exist, but you went from Armstrong to Ottawa in 60 days? Like, hello? It's, that's quite the accomplishment, boys. And, hey, I said boys. Oh. Oh. Actually said boys twice. And, and oh, now, it's three, now it's three times. Boys, oh, boys, knock it boys. Off, All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, no, thanks question. so much, Ari. We really appreciate it. Wait. Yeah, when you guys were at Canoe Lake, right? What date was that of 2020? We, yeah, uh, we didn't date. go to Canoe Lake itself. We went through the park quite cr close to Canoe Lake. The original route plan was to end at Canoe Lake. Like, that's what I planned. But uh, Kalen, being more of the, uh, you know, uh, a people person, he uh, he thought you know it would be better, be more appealing if we ended in Ottawa rather than Canoe Lake, because you know not not everyone knows where Canoe Lake is, but everyone knows where Ottawa is. So we didn't actually go on Canoe Lake itself. We went very close to it. Probably the closest we got was on uh, day fifty-two from uh, Kiosk to Radiant Lake when we went by Cedar. That's okay, like, uh, eighty kilometers away from Canoe Lake. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's kind of close in comparison to the 2000 that you did, right? <laughs> yeah, it's relatively close. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, just like a half a day travel, a couple portages, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Not, not All right, I have a question. Were you uh, asking when we were on Canoe Lake? Because maybe you yourself were there this summer? Yes, I was. All right, not this summer. It was last summer, right? I did quite the journey last year. I did like uh, 31 days in the bush. Uh, but I jumped yeah, like you guys did, but I, I didn't do the portaging. I used my Ford F-150 to do the long parts. <laughs> so I kind of cheated, but I, I did uh, quite uh, the journey. Yeah. And, and you guys were mentioning uh, Killarney Outfitters. That's yeah. good. So oh, that yeah. was Ted E. Ted E. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, yeah, I know Ted. Ted is an awesome guy. Great. Uh, guy. He's, he's now got uh, like the Swift Canoes. He's part of like the whole package of the, you know, where to go to. And it, it, he's an awesome dude. And I'm so yeah. proud of him for donating and sponsoring you guys and helping you out. That That's awesome. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Kevin, or, sorry, Ted was such a, <laughs> such a huge uh, help when, when we were in Chaplo, we actually got the stuff that he, uh, he sponsored to us in our food drop when we were in Chaplo. So a long time before we even got to Killarney, but, uh, you know, and that stuff was so invaluable because that stretch between Chaplow and the Spanish River was arguably the hardest part of our trip. And the gear that he gave us, like a new barrel strap and a really nice new pack, like it was just ended up being so invaluable to us. Like, I don't know if we could have got through that area without the support that he provided. Yeah. Well, you, know, didn't, you didn't have to if you didn't listen to Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> well... Oh, but a big uh, shout out to uh, Ted East and Clarny Outfitters. I've actually got a big like stack of his stickers in my truck because uh, I, I visited him last uh, like my, my last summer trip. He's an awesome guy, and I'm so proud uh, that he helped you out. And I'm so proud of you guys for making it through this whole journey and the, with sponsors and help, like you know the community, like even Kevin Cowan. He he likes to make a few jokes, but this guy has got a massive brain of knowledge. And his book, uh, they also, the, the Canoe Roots of Ontario, like if, I don't know if you guys have read them, but you might want to pick one of those up and you, it might uh, gear you through your next uh, journey. Well, let, let's just say, Nolan, that um, um, the, the whole guiding thing, guidebook thing, uh, the, the route you went from Chapleau to the Spanish, I have no clue. I, <laughs> I, I don't know where you went. I don't know how you did that. I, I, I was like, what the? 
Yeah. Um, how did you? Uh, so you did. Uh, was it two 17 foot prospectors or what, what design did you use? Yeah, 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 two okay. 17 foot, yeah. And uh, okay. those Novacraft tough stuff, which, um, you know, we all miss Royal X, but I think Novacraft did a good job getting in there. Uh, tough stuff lasted us that trip. And, pretty tough. Uh, pretty tough. No, yeah. no, no. When you say tough, tough stuff, stuff I, I saw you guys wrap it around a rock <laughs> and then you bent it back straight. And oh, no. kept going. No, actually, it was too dangerous for us to get in there and back and try and pull that canoe out um, at the time. Um, so we actually ended up having again help from one of our sponsors, Rob from Paddlefoot, came in and gave us a different canoe um, that was happened to be red. So you might have not noticed the difference there, but um, but yeah, that, at at that point too, I mean, any boat would have wrapped around that rock and. Uh, in that situation. Oh, that's a spoiler alert because we haven't yeah. seen yeah. that. Yeah, let's not get too much yeah. it's in the highlights. It's in the highlights. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ari. Thanks for coming. Okay. On. Uh, All right. Congratulations, guys. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great night, Ari. Thanks. Bye. So I, I was gonna that that led me to another question. I was gonna ask you guys: Did you have any major malfunctions? And let's not get into what we were just talking about. But were were there any other major malfunctions with gear or? Yeah, you know, a lot of people were asking: Did you run out of food at any point? Like you guys are <laughs> six strapping young men, right? I'm sure you guys quite have have quite the hefty appetites, especially after canoeing for a whole day. Did you ever run out of food? Yeah. Oh, God, we had more than enough food. Think, like, these, yeah. these guys, every single time we'd see a store, like, <laughs> like these, these guys would go in and they'd buy, like, eight tubs of peanut butter. They would go in and buy, like, two kilograms of rice and, like, yeah. like so, no one would buy, like, eight tubs yeah, of Nutella. I put it all like, in my purse. You didn't have to carry any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we brought a lot of food. We were all heavy. We were always eating. We were always eating. For gear malfunctions, great question. I think mean, we um, the barrel yeah. strap. I was carrying the barrel. the The first yeah. barrel strap we had broken, like every way you can imagine. The second barrel strap we got again started to break. Once we got to Killarney Outfitters, Ted took a look at our uh, our our barrel strap. We said, "I'm going to get you one that's way better." Comes out with a brand new level six barrel <laughs> strap. Pulls it off, wraps it around our, our, our barrel, and never had a problem after that. No looking back. And then, um, yeah, and uh, I, I can't think of any more uh, malfunctions if the boys can. I mean, the Wanigan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Wanigan the had uh, – our first Wanigan we brought was um, not the one that George built because we had a problem where the billy kit couldn't uh, fit inside the Wanigan. So we just said, all right, we'll just bring this other Wanigan we have that's kind of old. And uh, – the 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 lips on the edge of the wanigan start to peel off. Yeah, and there was nails sticking. I remember out. like I'd have to like someone would come up to me and they'd be like, "All right, I'm gonna like pick up the wanigan and load it onto," and I'd be like, "Okay, you have to watch that nail and there's a splinter there and just like put your hand right here like this." <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was pretty bad. I thought that like at one point I was worried it was just gonna collapse on a portage and everything would just spill everywhere. But, yeah. <laughs> we all had a tetanus got- shot, so those rusty nails didn't really affect us. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. So even with the spoilers, Norma's still watching. And, and, and so did you guys lose sleep uh, trying to figure out what you're going to wear on the trip? Like, uh, Jacob, you had the Raptors, right? Yeah, I had the jersey. Um, we were provided with – like, we had sponsored gear. We had uh, Under Armour, Architerix send us, like, a lot of clothes and shoes. And I don't know. I decided to wear the Raptors jersey, rep the hometown, rep Toronto. When we're going out there, and I just like the look of the red, to be honest. Yeah. Other than that, I was wondering had, about that because uh, y'all had the bright yellow shoes too, right? Yeah. So I was oh, about to say we all had the same shoes and these same uh, shorts. Okay. They were all good for us. Our uh, Except Will buys. Okay, Will. I, I did not wear those shoes. The shoes look like tennis balls. I will not wear those shoes. <laughs> 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 I, I I've been wearing New Balance since the for well. eight, nine. I always wear my newies on on every new trip I go on. Good, reliable, cheap shoes, good stuff. Nice. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you guys want to shout out a few of your uh, sponsors that you had for this? Because, like I say, it takes a team to uh, to put together a journey like this, and without backing, it makes it a little more difficult. So, take take a moment and uh, thank a few of your sponsors or mention a few of your sponsors. 
Yeah, I think I can I can sort of uh, speak to that uh, as far as yeah. I mean, like we had um, several levels of sponsorships. Uh, yeah, I got them right here, Nolan. So first of all, thanks to to AKA Raisin, which is the company that we use to help, uh, like you know, actually make our website to have people be able to donate. Um, GB for 60 days of food, Novacraft Canoe for blessing us with our two 17-foot prospectors, and then uh, Rob from Paddlefoot. Um, moving on down there, we got uh, Telus. Telus helped us out by giving us a phone for the trip that we used for a lot of the filming and also gave us like a, a plan that we had unlimited talk and text and data and then threw us two grand towards the funding of the trip. And then Man Rock, who helped us out not with the drive that we needed on Superior, but also with uh, with funding as well. Architerics, Under Armour, Canoeing.com, Grey Owl Paddles, the Andes Hotel in Ottawa. Again, big thanks to Killarney Outfitters. Peaches and Greens, who uh, kind of helped us out with all of our like vitamins and nutrition. I saw a comment up there which said something about – did you guys take gummies before bed? And like, yeah, we definitely took our vitamins before bed. Thanks to peaches and greens, uh, wacky towels, of course. And um, the last one there, Federal Wilderness. Then. Federal Wilderness. You have a list, Kevin. Why are you laughing? I miss, you're good, man. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I say, it, it's a sponsorship that really, uh, really helps out along this thing. And it's a, you know what? These, these companies need to be recognized because you know what? They realized the good that you were doing and they, they pitched in. So exactly. kudos to all them sponsors. Absolutely. Hey guys, was there, a, was there a time uh, in the last, maybe even probably even the last month or, or even when you finished where let's pretend you're in, in a, in a room, like it's imaginary thing. You're in a, in a room and all these old guard pallers are gathering around and they're, they're knocking crap out of you. Like, Oh, these young kids, you know, they want to queue for COVID across, like, blah, 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 blah. and they don't know you're there. If that ever happened, would you, at this point in time, what would you say to them? Because you did it. You did the trip. And you raised, you raised more money than you thought you would. You did the trip. You did it safe. Would you say something? Or, and if you did, what would you say? I'd probably uh, look at these uh, older gentlemen and women who are discussing this canoeing, and I'd be like, uh, just wondering if you guys have ever been from Shaplo to the top of the Spanish River. I don't think I'd say anything at all. I think <laughs> yeah, I'd just crack yeah, laughing, and then I'd walk away and just, just chuckle to myself. Like, <laughs> I'd show yeah, them like, the I, I, I would yeah. laugh at them, you know? Like, I, I don't have anything to say. I think I think I'd flip down the canoe or the pack that I'm carrying and put it on their back and and just hang out. You don't want to break their back, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. But but Kevin, it's a good question because you know, like, it, it's a different thing we did for sure. It was different, and for sure, people, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, people don't like change. People don't like, you know, the idea of just going out and having the spontaneous canoe trip we did. And um, as you say that, like, imagine if there was people who were negative. It's hard to imagine because of how much positivity we had, right? It's really hard to imagine. And most uh, of the negative stuff is still with a, such a heavy hint of positivity to it. Yeah. But it's just like nitpicking at, you know, certain things about trip. But why did you guys carry a wand again, right? It's like, you know, we're, we're, we obviously, you know, like carrying a wand again is something that we did because we chose to do it for tradition, right? So there's different aspects of it that you know some everyone everyone trips differently right so I'd i guess that's what i'd say i'd say as well like man you see us like we're city kids right like we all grow up in like downtown toronto you know like we're not the type of kids really you would that you would think would like do something like this you know so it's like i can understand absolutely like a heavy degree of skepticism you know like especially last year before we even did the trip people are like yeah yeah right you're gonna do this you know like I, I can understand it, you know, like if they don't know us, like that's, you know, like that, it makes sense to me why. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'd really say anything. Just watch the documentary. Yeah. Who, who in the paddling community do you guys look up to? Oh, Tim Barber. Um, 
Justin Barber. Yeah. yeah I looked at his videos a lot before we planned ours mm -hmm. and especially the way he filmed his documentary. I'd never really seen someone do like a huge trip like that on YouTube before. I know there's other people, but he was the first person that really caught my eye. And that really, like it really inspired me, especially I really wanted to do a documentary after that. Yeah. And um, for me, it was uh, Adam Schultz. It's been, been a huge inspiration um, reading his books. I mean, just, just the, I think it's so cool about Adam and Kevin, we talked about it before you interviewed him, is that all of his stories are kind of like, you know, it never went the way he planned. And it always, you know, whether, you know, alone against the North, like he, he didn't want to do it alone, but he ended up having to do it because no one else would do it with him. And that's just the essence of canoe trip, right? It never goes as planned. I think pursuit of passion as well. A bunch of us watched their documentary, like in Wabakimi, and like that's where how we knew about the mountain goat portage. I think like George and Jacob, I believe you guys watched that before we went on our trip, and that was the pursuit of passion video. And and we should have watched the video a little closer because what we didn't realize is like what they did is they like rigged their stuff up to the pulley system that's like already there like you don't even have to do anything like there's already a pulley system there we just like carried our stuff <laughs> I, I was gonna ask why you guys didn't use carabiners at the end of your news <laughs> and then and then string the rope down like <laughs> do, we, do we even have enough carabiners no, i don't i don't know so. we don't have any carabiners so. like we no one had told us about any of this i couldn't find any information about this online like we just we just showed up there and i was thinking yeah. like i was thinking of you know scratching my head and i was thinking Gee whiz, we must have gone the wrong way. The yeah. must have been on the other side of the river. Like, and then Jacob saunters up and it's like, oh, I, I, I saw this in a documentary from like the 1970s or something. <laughs> Trust me, guys, you have to go down this cliff. And I was like, all right. Have <laughs> yeah. We have, we have Bruce was we made an assembly line. We, we made yeah. an assembly line. Like, we, we had guys like holding on to like this rope on the cliff with one hand grabbing the canoe with the other. And we just, we, yeah, this whole um, it was ridiculous. Whole system, ridiculous. Like, one one person holding the each thing at a time. We were just kind of passed it down. It was it was obscene. It was it was just oh, it was absurd. I never thought I'd be doing that ever. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah, you know what? So you got some good inspirations there. Uh, Justin Barber's awesome. Uh, yeah, David Lee yeah, does some really nice stuff as well. So yeah. yeah. That that Kopka portage uh, is brutal, Dennis. Seriously, it's brutal. I, I've never done it, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, cameras can't do it justice. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. When we look back at that footage, I, I don't know if it's just the heat of the moment, but I'm like, it, it was it was steeper, right? I remember getting steeper. to the edge and like being oh. really, like scared as to like it's absurd. I saw, I saw some. I saw like Tim or someone go ahead with their pack on their back, and like they were just kind of crawling down the side of it, and I was like. Absolutely no way I'm doing this with a wand again on my neck. <laughs> no yeah. way, boys. Like we got like what are we doing here? I was so scared, but yeah. we figured out we just had a little uh, <laughs> that's crazy. Well it's an, it, it's an actual like like sheer cliff, like it's at least a 90 degree angle. Like it's just it's it's just it's a drop. It's just a vertical cliff of rock, and you're supposed to bring your like boat down that. Well, what are you doing next week, Kevin? Let's go check it out. Or have oh, you no. no, no. <laughs> Actually, I, I would I would do that uh, in a heartbeat again because of the scenery. Uh, it's oh, like yeah. On there. oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I was, I was saying earlier in this uh, interview how the like above that portage and below that portage. I don't know if you like when you were there. I don't know if you saw that like spring coming out of the cliffs. But uh, that was in our first episode, and yeah, I, I mentioned that earlier as one of my top highlights of the trip. I, I had the privilege of uh, we camped there for two nights before we did that portage. Uh, my first time with uh, um, I was with Andy and also uh, Bill and Ann o o Osterm from Osterm Packs, and Andy and I went for paddle just to check out that portage while they stayed at camp. And we came back earlier than they thought, and they were they were skinny dipping and doing the nasty and <laughs> you saying that story sorry <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a, a family, family show, family show. <laughs> yeah, so, just like half said right so <laughs> audience. Well, you know what, guys uh we're, we're at that nine o'clock hour um just like to uh to get a little bit of a closing here um what was the biggest takeaway from this entire adventure um that you guys experienced. Uh, let's start with Will over there. 
I, I hands down have one like lesson that like even on trip, you know, when I was thinking because throughout trip I'd I'd have my alone time, I'd reflect on this stuff, I'd think about it. And the hands down, the absolute number one thing I learned was the absolute like just sheer extent of human generosity. Cause you see, like like before I went on this trip, it was it was the start of COVID. People were everyone's kind of anxious and angry and cooped up and it was just like there's so much aggression and just like like I didn't have any good interactions with anyone in Toronto. So my, my faith in humanity was uh <laughs> it's kind of iffy, you know? But then like I went to northern Ontario, right? I swear to God, every single person we met was just an absolute like like an absolute gem. Like like I remember every single one and there the, the people up there are absolutely amazing. Like for for example, on uh you know, just to give you a an anecdote, Lake Superior, we uh, we were paddling along, it's probably like 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m. We saw uh, this man standing on the shore, and we paddled up mm. to him and uh, asked him how he was going, and his name was Scott. We just talked to him for a little bit, and then we kept on paddling. And about an hour later, Scott pulls up behind us in his motorboat, <laughs> and gives us all like breakfast sandwiches with bacon and eggs. Like, he didn't have to do that. He just went out of his, you know, the, the extent... It, you know, that's just one example, but we just met so many people like that up in the north, like just the just such amazing and generous, just kind people who just helped us out so much along the way. And that that really like, you know, really brought back my faith in humanity um, that. Yeah, definitely. The uh, the generosity of those people definitely taught me a lesson. Uh, I'd say for me, it was a, definitely a lesson on human willpower um, and, and teamwork as well, like really like man like i know none of us would have got this done if it was like a solo trip i'll mm -hmm. tell you right now like it was it was a group effort through and through and it was like the boys like we all got each other the boys all got each other through <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was just a group thing you know like we couldn't none of us could have done it and and it's when you have other people with you who are like so motivated to achieve like at a higher level, then then you too become much more motivated than you would by yourself to achieve at that at that much higher level. Awesome. How about you, Cal? Yeah, um, I think one of the big lessons I took away from the trip is you can never be a hundred percent certain, and if something <laughs> will repeat it a lot. When we were in the dark lands and just throughout trip, I mean, there's so many areas we went where we would kind of make this mistake by saying, no, no, I'm certain like up ahead, there's a portage on the right. And then you get there and you say, what? Okay, I guess I was wrong. And, and you get to that point where you realize in that country, there's no, there's no certainty. And that's what makes canoe trip amazing is that you get out there and you have your plan and you know that it's not going to go that way. And your plan is almost just this rough guideline for the unexpected of what's to come. And it's, it's something that carries on throughout life. I think just don't make assumptions and never be certain on anything. Cool. George. All right. So I think you guys covered a lot of like the really big, big takeaways from, I think my personal takeaway I'd get was honestly just like how happy it made me every day to feed the boys. Like it was, I'd, you know, everyone would be in the tent sleeping or whatever it was. And I'd be the only one out there. Maybe no one would be there feeding the fire with me. And I'd yell out, boys, dinner. And you'd see like a herd that doesn't come before the boys. And it would just be like, oh, the smile on their face. You see everyone eating their food. They're like, oh, this is so good. Like it was a really wholesome moment at the end of every day just to you know, sit back and feed the boys. I think you said boys five times there, man. <laughs> boys. boys, boys, boys. <laughs> <laughs> last but not least jacob yeah the boys of they, <laughs> like, oh, everyone's talking about like a lot of important aspects that i learned on this trip and honestly like there's just countless lessons i've learned on this trip like the generosity of people up in those like northern communities is definitely a big one i had a lot of personal growth on the trip as i'm sure a lot of the boys did as well i learned like you know, you can like rely on your boys when you're there. And it's like, I made five friends who are probably gonna be like my best friends for the rest of my life. And that's definitely like something I'll always have.
Yeah. Awesome. I think uh, – Couldn't have said it better. Did I get cut out halfway through my speech? No, no, you were good. You were no, good. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, you your there. volume was good. And okay. I, I got I got one one more final closing <laughs> thing before we end, we end the show tonight. And this is a, this is a one word answer that I'd like to get from each of you. End of the trip, paddling into Ottawa. Your feelings? Oh God, I was so sweaty and hot. I like. Shower, shower is my word. One shower. <laughs> one shower. I need I need to take a goddamn shower. <laughs> shower. That's my word. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, for me, like surreal, probably. Just it, it was. It was like you know, you work two months, twenty four hours a day. You know, for two months, and to achieve this goal, and then you finally achieve it, and it's done, and it's like, what do I do now? Yeah, so, yeah for me, definitely surreal, sad, bittersweet. Words. <laughs> I know it's to sum up. <laughs> it's not a word, but like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly. That's it. Did I miss hey, you, Caleb? Seventy days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Jacob. I'd have to go with Nolan. Just surreal. Definitely, oh. just a surreal moment. It's kind of spooky, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, seeing all those people in buses and stuff. All eyes on you. It's weird. It's weird. Feel, no, feel. no no, emotional thing, like, you know, that little lump in your throat or, oh, you yeah. know. Oh, that. that's well, that. I, yeah. was, um, I felt you know, like a Martian or something. Like, I felt like I was on the wrong planet. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> what on earth is going on. Like, there were, like, people and, like, lights and buses and, like, for all these like weird things going on, like like take in for two months, like none of us had even flicked the light switch. Okay, like like take that in, and then we show up in downtown Ottawa, and that's like a metropolitan area of like what, like 1.3, 1.4 million people. That's like that's a pretty big city, you know. That's kind of <laughs> it's kind of jarring, and there's there really aren't that many suburbs around Ottawa. It's kind of you just you're paddling along the river, you're in wilderness, and then bam, you're in the city. It's just oh. Oh my God! It's a complete shock. Speaking of the river, before we go, shout out to Paul for letting us stay on his property last yeah. little trip. Really big homie. Huge really homie. homie, Paul. Yeah, yeah, that was it was Paul. that was so weird going into Ottawa, and um, like the the feeling of of just who who are these people and like why do they care? What? <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, obviously they care. I, one of the one of the best memories is, like, it's so weird, you know, portaging a canoe through a city. And we were going on this trail along the river. It was our second last portage, <laughs> this portage before. And, and there was, like, we were on a biking path, and there was these trees on the side. And we all just started. I looked, and I was like, last bushwhack, boys. And we just started running through these trees. <laughs> and I was in a lot of these going through. And, and, you know, people looking at us like we're nuts. But, um <laughs> <laughs> Great memory. I'll remember that. I actually, boys, I walked by that place. I was in Ottawa a week ago and I walked by that place and I walked by that same, those same set of trees and I just brought it right back in my head. <laughs> oh man. Back in, the, back in the winter after I was visiting you guys up in Pembroke, I went to Ottawa for a day and I, uh, I went to where we put in at the very end of our final portage right mm. below Parliament. And that just, oh my God, the flashbacks was just crazy. That's Anxiety Rock, I believe, is the spot yeah. we're at. What's it called? Anxiety Rock? <laughs> That's what I call it. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, what it is. Cool. Awesome. Well, you know what, guys? Great evening. Uh, thanks very much for spending your Tuesday night with us uh, and sharing this story. This is uh, quite the epic journey. I, I could tell you guys really took a lot out of this. Um, you gave a lot out of this, uh, and that's that's the most important part. So, I commend you on uh, what you've done and the uh, the funds that you raised for a couple of great causes. And uh, you know what? I hope in the future you guys you know consider maybe doing something like this again. It makes for a really good video, and it also yeah. makes for a really good story. So, yeah. congratulations, guys! I applaud you on that. Everybody in the chat, throw some uh, little hand claps in the uh, in the live chat. 
Uh, we're going to close up for the night. I'm going to drop you guys into the basement here uh, for a moment. Stick around. I want to talk to you in the green room after the show, uh, and uh, we'll get on to there. So thanks again, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you, Dennis. Good. Thank, Thank you so much for having us on. Thanks. Yeah. You guys thanks, rock. Dennis. Kevin, I'll see you in the green room as well, okay? <laughs> no, i got to work. No, I'm you'll work. Work. <laughs> right, man. We'll be a bad influence for half an hour. we got some more drinking to do. I don't no! know. <laughs> okay, see you fellas in a moment here. Cheers. All right, everybody. So, uh, yeah, you know what? What an inspirational story. These guys are uh, true characters and uh, they're stand up fellas. You know, uh, you wouldn't expect that out of uh, many fellas their age. And the fact that uh, they did what they did, uh, you know, for a couple of great causes during such a hard time in life, uh, you know what? I commend them quite largely. So, anyways, uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, tomorrow night on the camping show on the YouTube channel, CW Gets Outdoors. I will be a guest on their show. And uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Canoe Hound and Canoe Hound Adventures and why I do what I do, uh, you might want to tune into that. I will put the link in my Facebook page uh, at uh, Canoe Hound's Outdoor Adventure Show. I'll get that up on there tonight, I believe, or tomorrow morning. So you can check that out, click on the link, and hope to see you tomorrow. That's at 6 o'clock Eastern, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, we will also keep you posted on what's going to be happening next week. I'm just working on next week's show, so I don't want to announce it until I have everything set in stone. And, uh, yeah, that would probably be about that. Anyways, don't forget, Tory Baird, Jim Baird, they have their auction going for uh, on Instagram for Fox G1 Research. The link is right up there at the top of the chat. I believe I have it pinned up there. Go check it out. Bid on some great stuff. Help another great cause. And uh, support our outdoor community. Anyways, meantime, my name is Dennis. This is Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. And I remind you all to please keep the adventures alive. We'll see you next time. Cheers.